welcome everybody. Lovely to see you all and to be here in person for the first time uh, since, since the pandemic. It's also, of course, my first time um, chairing uh, this meeting. And I really want to take the opportunity to say a big thank you to, to Ruth Hussey, um, who's the FSA deputy chair, who uh, stepped in as the interim chair for six months. And I'm really grateful for the, for the time and commitment Ruth gave to the FSA during that period, and also the support that she's given me as I, I've settled in as chair. We have apologies today from Fiona Gately, one of our board members who's unwell and unable to uh, attend. I'd also like to welcome two new directors to the FSA who are joining us for their first board meeting today. Um, that's Katie Pettifer, who's the new director of strategy, legal communications and governance. And also to Pam Biedman, who's the director of finance and performance, who's in just her second week uh, with us. So welcome uh, to both of them. Now, whilst I really welcome the opportunity for us to be able to get together in person, uh, we have been very conscious of the restrictions, which uh, are still important uh, if we're to control uh, COVID-19. And we have followed all of the FSA's own safety guidance and procedures in relation to that, and all the necessary risk assessments have been conducted in relation to the venue. As part of that, we took the decision only to have the board and the executive members present today, um, but I hope that it won't be too long before we're able to welcome members of the public uh, back to, uh, to these meetings. But I'm delighted that many of you are joining us online today. We're also hoping that uh, our next uh, board meeting will be held in Cardiff um, and that will be a, an opportunity to connect with many of our stakeholders in Wales and I'm very much hoping that that will be possible. I think after those uh, introductory remarks, it's time to get on with the general business of the day. So can I just start by asking our board members if they have any new conflicts of interest uh, or other matters that they wish to declare? No? Thank you. Um, and my second question is whether there are any other, uh, any matters for any other business that we should uh, be aware of. No? Okay, thank you. So if we press on now to um, consider the questions which have been received um, in advance of this, uh, of this board meeting. Um, before I ask uh, Stephen Pollock, who's our Director of Communications, to read out the questions, I just wanted to put on record um, a few changes that we've made um, to the procedure for handling these questions. The deadline for anybody wishing to submit a question remains as previously, um, and that is noon on the day before the meeting. Questions which are received after this deadline won't be read out as part of the meeting, but we will consider them as part of our routine correspondence. So people are welcome to write into the board and we will try to, uh, we will respond to that. Questions which have been received in advance of this board meeting, um, which are about general FSA business, but which don't particularly pertain to a paper which we're discussing today, um, will not be read out and they'll also be treated as correspondence. And that's simply to help us uh, manage the business of the day that we have in front of us. Once the uh, Director of Communications has read out the remaining questions which relate to matters under discussion, um, I will identify who is going to answer each question and during which agenda item. So this is a slight change to what we have done over the last few meetings, but I hope it means that people get a more immediate response to questions which relate directly to the matters we're discussing. We'll ensure that um, we uh, provide, uh, um, we're not going to provide a separate written response as we have in the past, because actually the response to the question will be embedded as part of the record of the meeting. It will be in the minutes, and of course it will be available for people to view on the web um, as, as a matter of, of the public record. There may, of course, be um, a, a occasions, and I hope they'll be rare, where it's not possible to answer the question in full during the course of the meeting. And if that should happen, then we will, of course, uh, send a written response within the next two weeks, and we will make sure that that response is published on our website. 
and I hope people, board members and indeed members of the public, are, com are, are, are sort of confident that that will maintain the ability for people to question the board and to receive uh, responses. And it's very much part of our commitment to openness and transparency in, in what we do. So Stephen, if I could now hand over to you to ask you to read out the questions which relate to matters we're going to discuss today. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And to add to what you have already said and to place on the record, we have received four questions about regulated products, which doesn't feature as an issue on the agenda today. Answers to these will be provided on the website so that they are part of the record of the board discussion uh, and will be published in full. Three questions we have. First one is from Samantha Brook, who is the Chief Executive of the British Society of Plant Breeders Limited. And Ms Brook asks, to ask the FSA Board why, in Dr Ruth Hussey's letter to DEFRA Secretary George Eustace of the 16th of March 2021, the FSA suggests that the absence of data relating to the safety of gene-edited products means that, quote, it is not currently possible to give a comprehensive safety statement on these technologies in food and feed, end quote. When the European Food Safety Authority, in a scientific opinion delivered in November 2020, confirmed that simple genome edited plants, the subject of the recent DEFRA consultation, pose no greater risks than equivalent conventionally bred plants, a scientific opinion which has been reiterated by other high-level scientific publications and advice, including from the European Academy's Science Advisory Council and the European Commission's high-level group of scientific advisors. And that's the end of the question from Samantha Brook. The second question is from Dr. Tina Barsby, OBE, and Dr. Barsby is the Chief Executive of the National Institute of Agricultural Botany. Dr. Brooks, uh, Dr. Barsby asks the FSA board why, in the paper, on genome editing on today's agenda, the description of other existing regulated product regimes does not include reference to the regulatory framework for the approval and consent to market new conventionally bred plant varieties. This is a proven system of robust outcomes-focused regulation which operates effectively alongside existing UK food safety, environmental protection and novel foods legislation with an impeccable track record of safety. Over time, this system has been adapted to take account of new policy or market requirements and can readily embrace plant varieties produced with new precision breeding techniques. And the final question is from a Mr. and Mrs. D. Poyner. Mr. and Mrs. Poyner ask the board, can you please consider making it mandatory in England as I believe it is in Wales, to display the hygiene rating at every eating establishment. This would give the public an immediate knowledge of the eating place. We have just returned from holiday and always check before we eat, and it's amazing how many low-scoring eateries do not display their rating. Also, it would be a massive incentive to those who have a low score to upgrade their standards. Thank you. And that concludes the questions for today, Chair. Thank you, Stephen. Um, so I will answer that final point uh, in my uh, chair's report, and I'm going to ask uh, Rebecca Sudworth to uh, pick up the two questions in relation to genome editing uh, during that agenda item. So um, we'll move on now to consider the minutes from the, uh, from the last meeting. Um, this was a meeting that was chaired by, uh, by Dr. Ruth Hussey on the 16th of June. And if I could ask uh, members whether they're happy to accept these minutes as an accurate record of that, of that meeting or if they have any comments or factual corrections to make. I think everyone's content. Thank you. Um, there were only two actions arising from the last minute, both of which we're going to pick up at the board retreat next month. Um, one's going to be carried forward. Um, are board members content with that approach or is there anything further you wish to discuss in relation to those items today? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to uh, proceed on now to uh, give you uh, my report to the board. Um, 
I suppose the most important thing to say is that I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be here as, as your chair and, and thank you all for the warm welcome you've given me, um, but also to the welcome I've received from our, from our stakeholders. And I've spent the last couple of months um, meeting with many people and a list of my engagements is, uh, has been published on our, on our website. Those meetings have included uh, conversations with, with ministers in uh, England, Wales and Northern Ireland. I've met with the chair of Food Standards Scotland um, and I've also met with a number of industry and uh, consumer groups. It's been great to be able to meet with them, get a sense of their views of the FSA, uh, what we do well, but perhaps more importantly, things where we could be doing more or where we could and how we can work with them and I really hope that we can maximize our impact with uh, you know ever more collaborative uh, working. As the Covid restrictions ease I'm really hoping to be able to get out and about a little bit more and meet people uh, face to face and uh, in fact uh, next week I shall be making a visit to Wales and then shortly after that at the beginning of October I'm looking forward to uh, going to uh, Northern Ireland meeting with our NIFAC committee and other stakeholders. Within the FSA, my focus has been on uh, meeting with our staff and understanding in much more detail about the work of the agency. I've been hugely impressed by the dedication and professionalism of, of our staff and I really thank them all uh, for the work they continue to do day in, day out um, to keep food safe. And perhaps especially to those people who've been uh, involved in developing all the new procedures which have arisen as a consequence of EU exit, because that has been a very, very substantial um, increase in, in the work of the, of the agency. And I should also note too those people who've been working really on the front line to maintain official controls during the pandemic. Um, they have in many cases gone over and above uh, what we could reasonably expect them to do and I do want them to know how, how much we value and appreciate, uh, appreciate their work. I've also been uh, focusing uh, in terms of, of looking forward at what we might do next on work with, uh, with Emily, the Chief Exec, and with colleagues across the FSA to review and refresh the FSA strategy. We're going to discuss that at the board retreat next month, um, and I hope that we'll be able to bring that to a board meeting uh, very shortly. I think it's a timely moment to do this with so many changes which have impacted on the way the agency, uh, the agency works. So I think that's uh, a, a, the summary of what I've been up to. It's been a busy couple of months, um, uh, but uh, I have very much enjoyed it and, and really looking forward uh, to continuing that work. Are there any questions from board members about any of that? Okay. Um, I also said that I would answer the question from uh, uh, two members of the public in relation to the food hygiene ratings and I should say I'm really delighted when, uh, when people uh, you know, are interested enough in what we do to, to send in these questions. And so we were asked really about whether we were going to uh, mandate these so that they were displayed in England in the same way that they are in, in Wales and Northern Ireland, where businesses are required by law to display their ratings. The board has previously expressed the view that it is strongly uh, in favour of this approach in England, and I totally um, endorse that. We think it'd be better for consumers and it would be better for businesses that are doing the right thing and maintaining these high standards. We think it will also give an incentive to other businesses uh, who are perhaps not doing so well at the moment uh, to improve. We know that there's a lot of support for this uh, from local authorities, from consumers and from businesses. And we have submitted a strong evidence case um, to government who need to decide whether to support it and therefore whether to introduce the legislation because that's not something that the FSA itself can do. I hope that that will happen, but I think we also need to be conscious that given current circumstances and, and priorities really imposed by the pandemic, ministers have not yet taken a view on this and we need to be uh, patient and just wait a little longer, but I am hopeful that they will be supportive. A statutory scheme would require new primary legislation and so even when we have their support, it's, it is difficult for me to know uh, when that will be put in place and I can't give specific assurances on that. 
But in the meantime, we will continue to do everything we can with our local authority partners to ensure a better voluntary take-up of these schemes um, so that we can really maximise the impact uh, as we go forward. Thank you. Um, I think that concludes my report, and so um, I'm going to hand over now to the next item on the agenda, which is the report from the Chief Executive. Before I do so, I should say that although um, most of the executive team have been able to join us in person, we are being joined online by, uh, by two colleagues. Um, the first, just to introduce them briefly, is uh, Julie Pierce, who's the Director of Openness Data, Digital Science and Wales, and also by Rick Mumford, who is the Deputy Director of Science, Evidence and Research. And now, Emily, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Good morning, everyone. It's really lovely to see you all. Um, so uh, my report was published on Monday, and I know board members will have had a chance to read it, so I don't plan to, um, to go into too much detail in this introduction. Um, uh, I want to mention uh, a few things. So first of all, I talk about the National Food Strategy, which Henry Dimbleby published in July and gave some thoughts um, about his comments on the Food Standards Agency and the possibility of us taking on new responsibilities. And to summarise my thoughts, they are, um, we think the proposals are very interesting, we're very conscious of resource constraints and the need for potential legislation on one or two of them. Um, but, but that's that. Um, on import controls, as ever in EU exit matters, things have changed since my report was published on Monday. Um, so just to update the board, yesterday um, Lord Frost and the Paymaster General Penny Mordaunt made statements to the House of Commons and House of Lords to, um, to say that the government has decided to delay further some elements of the import controls that were planned to be introduced in October and then in January, um, so October 2021 and January 2022. And it's these um, controls which relate to the sanitary and phytosanitary check, so to do with animal and plant um, health and human health. Um, so it, what the government said yesterday is that now pre-notification of agri-food imports will start on the 1st of January 2022 instead of the 1st of October 2021. And the physical checks that will happen at border control posts will now start on the 1st of July 2022. Um, and that's also when export health certificates from imported food from the EU to the UK would commence too. So those are changes um, since my report. Obviously, we're absorbing the implications of yesterday's announcements, but our early thoughts are as follows. We will continue to monitor key food safety and data sources in the run-up to the um, pre-notification uh, introduction in January because this provides us with data analytics which help mitigate the fact that we don't now get the alerts from um, Europe. Um, and we don't think that this fundamentally alters the food safety risk of EU food and feed, which we always considered to be low. We do want the pre-notification capability, we think it will help us, um, but we, we think it doesn't fundamentally alter the food safety risk. And then just to highlight um, a few other areas, so I mentioned that we have published a register of the validated applications on regu regulated products. Um, I talk about the fact that we've now applied a new approach to anomalous results um, in shellfish harvesting areas. Um, we've done that across over 300 harvesting areas. Um, I mentioned the product recall of cat food because of feline pancytopenia. Um, and then I also mentioned the allergen labeling change, which is due on the 1st of October. There are other things in there too, but over to you. Great, thank you, Emily. And um, though I'm sure a number of items there that the board will, will want to comment on. Um, if I could just start by saying, I think your comments uh, on the recommendations for the National Food Strategy, uh, for the FSA, which were in the National Food Strategy, uh, were very helpful. And I concur with you that there is much that the FSA can offer in this space. Um, but uh, resourcing is, is, a, is a key concern. We know that the financial environment is very, very tight. Um, 
it will be helpful to hear the views of the board about this matter, but I'm very mindful that this is something that we can pick up much more fully when we think about our future strategy. And so even though that was the first part of Emily's paper, can I encourage the board to start our discussion this morning on some of the other aspects of the report and we can come back to the NFS um, you know, towards the end of the discussion if there are points you wish to make. But I think it's, it would be easy for us to spend a lot of time talking about that. Um, and I'd quite like to talk about those operational issues which are, are very pressing at the moment. Um, and of course, the delay in pre-notification is something that it's important that the board are, are aware of because that does have implications for our core business. So over to you. Kong, you are first off the mark. Chair, thank you. And Emily, thank you very much for the report. Uh, my question is really just on the, the, the news that you've brought to us this morning of the changes in that. Uh, and, and these are implications for all of the UK because obviously a lot of these things are, are focused uh, on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Can I just understand the real implications operationally for us as, a, as a, an agency? Um, I mean, Rebecca may want to uh, follow up on a, a bit more detail, but um, the, at the, until uh, the end of last year, we had access to the RASAF alerts, so the rapid alert system, um, which was an EU-based system. We haven't had access to that since January. And as a consequence, if there's a food incident, um, we are not able to trace back um, the food that comes from the EU because we're not getting the pre-notification of the goods as they hit um, border control. We, we have done all sorts to try and mitigate that risk, which you've heard about before, so the data analytics, strategic surveillance, and very, very impressive um, complex data work that we do to try and uh, deal with that. And when we had an incident earlier this year with um, salmonella in breaded chicken from Poland, actually the retailers were extremely cooperative and we were able to trace back um, food with their assistance. But there is a gap in our, in our toolkit, basically, and the pre-notifications will help enormously uh, from January. Thank you. Um, Mark. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Emily, thank you for your report. Really informative, as always. Um, my question relates to your comments in here about the, uh, the non-compliant imports through Dover. Um, you use the phrase, uh, we've seen a significant reduction. Does that mean there was a significant problem to start with? Um, and bearing in mind the announcement that we heard yesterday, are we changing, have we learnt lessons from that? Is there anything that we're changing in the way we manage that situation at the Channel Ports? Thanks, Mark. Um, so the, the, we've, we've always thought this was not a significant issue. Um, we had, uh, it varies on the numbers, but I reported in May that there were 55 importers that we were concerned about. Almost all of them stopped uh, doing this when we talked to them. Uh, we've been working with um, HMRC to sort out the data. And um, we, I could say that there haven't been any non-compliances over the last few weeks, but there's a small possibility it could happen again, which is why I've used the language that I've used. Um, uh, in turn, uh, on the second part of your question, I'm going to hand over to Colin to see if he wants to add anything. Yes. No, uh, good morning. Um, I think I think that's absolutely right. That the the, the we believe that the the food safety risk is low uh, in terms of the numbers. Uh, there was one repeat offender, uh, which we have spoken to, but really we're, we're not talking about huge numbers here. And longer term, we know that there are plans in terms of white cliffs to have that that, that border control post there, so we'll be able to check through Dover. Thank you, um, David. Did I see that you were trying to catch my no, Margaret? Thank you, Susan, and welcome, and thank you, Emily, a uh, great report. Um, on um, pre-packed food for direct sale, allergen labelling, um, do you get the impression that most small businesses are now adequately uh, prepared for that? It's due to come in next month. Uh, that's my first question. Secondly, um, I noticed you mentioned the enforcement decision making um, in enforcement, uh, bringing it in-house. Um, which seems to me like a good idea because it gives a certain independence from um, an abattoir if enforcement decisions are needed there. I wondered if you could give us a little bit more on the importance of that and whether it was linked to um, the um, ops transformation um, program. And then just on the back of um, Mark's question, um, we know that uh, there's still a need when physical checks eventually come in for the infrastructure to be there. 
and we've heard that that is going quite slowly. Are you um, satisfied that that will progress in time now that you've got the uh, now that we've got the extra time? Thanks, Margaret. Um, so first of all, on the um, allergen labelling change, which is to apply um, uh, to a whole new category of food products, so pre-packed for direct sale products, the need for ingredients labelling, um, and, and whether small businesses are ready. So we, we, are, we have um, a lot of encouraging signs. So we know that um, last spring, so spring 2020, because we did a survey, that three quarters of um, businesses were already doing ingredients labelling on these products. And there's been a survey more recently from an independent body from GS1, which has found that um, although businesses uh, don't say they don't necessarily feel ready, actually they have done a lot to prepare. Um, we've also been very grateful to both UK Hospitality and the British Retail Consortium for using their networks to distribute um, information and local authorities have been doing the same. So we think we've done a lot um, to help businesses prepare. We know that for some of them it, it is a big deal, it's a big change. Um, but it is incredibly important because for, for allergy sufferers, it can be a life or death issue. So we think it's, it's worth it. Um, on the uh, question of enforcement decision, I'm going to hand that over to Colin um, to take. And on physical infrastructure, actually, I'll hand that over to Rebecca to take as well, if that's OK. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. So in relation to the delegation of enforcement, a, a number of drivers in respect of making the change. One is, as part of the implementation of the official uh, controls regulations which came in from December 19 we've been making some changes and moving uh, enforcement to a public official as opposed to a contractor is consistent with that we also think that um, that, that we will be able to assure greater consistency uh, between abattoirs across the country if we bring it in-house so those are the those are the two primary drivers Rebecca Thank you. Uh, apologies, could you just remind me of your question, Margaret? In infrastructure. Microphone, Margaret. Sorry, there's been quite a lot of um, chatter about infrastructure not being ready in time when physical checks finally come in. There's now a delay. Are we satisfied that we'll be able to carry out those physical checks? In other words, is the work now um, progressing in the way we'd like to see it? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so um, obviously uh, preparation of the physical infrastructure is, is a responsibility for DEFRA. Um, we work very closely with DEFRA officials um, so that, you know, it's absolutely clear what checks are required, how they should be carried out. And, um, you know, we're, we're fully part of those plans. Um, and as we've um, heard, heard today, some of the, the physical checks are now going to take place to a, a longer time scale, which will, which will allow a bit more time for preparation but we're very closely involved in those plans. I mean, I, I, and just to supplement that, I mean, some things won't be ready in time. Um, there, there, there are, um, uh, it does obviously give everyone a few more months to prepare, but there are certain additional border control posts that we would like to see in place where we can do the import checks, which are not at existing um, border posts, and they will take longer. Is that a risk? Um, in my view, and uh, I assume, I'm hoping Rebecca agrees with me, um, the, it's the pre-notification capability that is going to take us a lot of the way to mitigating the risk here. Um, that, that makes a huge difference to our, um, to our controls. Um, so starting that from January will really help. We would also like the ability to um, direct port health authorities to do um, the uh, the uh, in-person checks and, and so on that will be introduced from July next year. But we need to remember that EU food and feed at the moment is very low risk. So actually, uh, although um, we think if this, if this capability wasn't in place for a long time, we would be concerned, actually the period of time since January this year is not that great. So we're less concerned than we otherwise would be. Thank you. Margaret, if I could just um, follow up a little bit more on your comments about the, um, the changes in the allergen law. Um, Emily mentioned that um, we've been working quite closely with business to really enact that. But I should also say that 
we've been working closely with uh, with some of the charities and the foundations um, on this and in fact I'm meeting with them Emily and I are meeting with them next week and their support uh, is, is really helpful in getting the message out and reminding I think not just businesses but consumers themselves that we need them to be asking and questioning businesses too because if we're all working in the same direction this is going to uh, this is going to land much 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 more successfully and and we're you know really grateful for that for their support and the ability to, to work with them because I think they connect to a different community than perhaps we're able to do. Are there any other questions on the board? Ruth. Thank you. Thank you for the comprehensive report, Emily. Um, just want to pick up shellfish um, and just, you know, to recognise how much work the FSA has done to uh, respond to the, the issues that arose around shellfish um, and, and, the, and the sort of consideration of the classification system, which I know, um, you know, our aim is to be both proportionate but also protect the public's health. Um, and I see in the, in the paragraph uh, that you're talking about reviewing the sampling protocols further. I suppose my question is, um, who do we share the results with? Because obviously we can take action in uh, advising on what, what sort of classification that particular harvesting area has. But the real issue is that the water is dirty. Um, and um, do we have a, a, a shared understanding with the agencies that can do something about it uh, to respond uh, when we have sampled particular areas? What, what's the relationship there? I will come to Rebecca in a second to, to supplement what I'm going to say. Um, so first of all, on the on the amount of work that we've done on this, it has been huge. And, I, and the board, I hope, will remember that last December when we met and I was talking about what life might be like after um, after Brexit day, I said, you know, we are prepared, but there are some things that we can't envisage and we we haven't yet. Uh, we don't know what's going to come our way and we will have to respond when it emerges. And so it was that in January, the commission declared that they would take a different approach to shellfish imports than what um, people had been expecting. And as a consequence, that put all sorts of uh, businesses um, into difficulty. And we have done a, an enormous amount of work reviewing our approach, um, trying to make sure what we're doing is proportionate, uh, making sure that we protect the public uh, and so on. So um, yeah, I would like to add my thanks to, to the team, the scientists, the policy officials and so on on that. In terms of who we share the results with, so you'll know um, that we have been meeting, uh, we've met um, DEFRA ministers, we've also talked to Welsh ministers about this, um, and we think that uh, often the underlying issue is a question of water quality. Um, Rebecca, perhaps you could say a little bit more about what happens with the results <coughs> and how they get shared. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Yeah, so, um, so whenever there's a, a, an incident of pollution or contamination and, and high results are found in a particular shellfish harvesting area, um, an, an action state is declared and uh, a local group, a multi-agency group uh, led by the local authority enforcement officers and with the full involvement of the, um, of the relevant parties will get together to, to undertake an investigation to find out what has happened and why and to trace back if possible to the root cause. So, so that happens straight away. Uh, at policy level as well, as you've mentioned, we're, we're continuing to work with the representative bodies on what more can be done in the longer term. Um, and as Emily said, we're very clear that, um, you know, we're, we're sort of at the, um, uh, at the front end of this, but the root cause may, may go back much further. And uh, we've been very clear with uh, DEFRA and indeed colleagues in the Environment Agency that we, we need to work together on this, because in the longer term, those are going to be the, um, uh, the more sustainable solutions. Thank you. Um, now, having uh, started this off by saying, uh, let's not spend all of our time talking about the, <laughs> the national food strategy, uh, I think it would be remiss of me not to ask the board for their initial reactions and um, feelings about, uh, about some of those recommendations and the implications it might have for uh, our future strategy. Um, did, Tim. Thank you for that. Uh, and again, thank you, Emily, for uh, an excellent report. Um, yes, just an immediate reflection. Uh, I think welcome the recommendations and very much welcomed your response to the recommendations. Um, one of the things uh, that I particularly like is an ambition to expand on healthy and sustainable food. But I think the devil's in the detail. Um, and I think that any expansion around what the FSA does has to carry a mandate supported by legislation 
and of course concomitant resources. So whilst the ambition's there, I think it has to be borne out by practicalities. The other thing I just wanted to say very quickly was that um, I also liked uh, the proposal around the food system data programme. But of course, uh, data isn't information, and information has to be informed by evidence. Um, and that has to carry, uh, I think, a credible research base behind it. Uh, I suspect, but I don't know, and it'll be interesting to hear any insight, uh, as to whether we think there's adequacy in the current research and whether it actually works across sectors in the food chain. Because at the moment, there is fragmentation, I suspect, and I know from practical experience. So uh, if I could hear a little bit more about that, that'd be very helpful, either now or any in further discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Are there any other comments on this item? And then maybe I'll respond uh, to them in, as a batch. Margaret. Uh, just very briefly, and um, Emily mentioned in um, her report um, the idea that Zimbabwe is um, uh, calling for businesses to be mandated to report sales. And I was just going to say that we already have priorities at the FSA in what we would like to see when uh, it comes down to changes in the law. And you mentioned them, food hygiene ratings are mandated in England, really important. Uh, pace powers, uh, any legal changes needed for ops transformation. And um, I just um, feel that we should concentrate on our um, in, uh, core priorities there before we get um, too much involved in things which go a little bit wider than our uh, mandate. David? Yes, um, I think Henry has produced a very good and balanced report, and some of the press reporting has not been as balanced. Where Henry says that we should reduce our meat consumption, um, uh, he also makes it clear that there is no point reducing the number of animals produced on English farms if we're to have import substitution instead. That's terribly important. And he also makes the point that a lot of our animals perform a vital biodiversity role in the United Kingdom. Um, in the Somerset levels, for example, must have animals grazing on them if we're to maintain our biodiversity. So I just flag that up as one little point where I think his report has been well balanced and we need to keep the overall thing in perspective and some of the media reports have not been as balanced as Henry Dimbleby's report. Well, I'm sure Henry will be gratified to hear that. <laughs> Um, so I, I, you know, good points both from from Margaret and and Tim. I, uh, you know, absolutely uh, am committed. We have got to maintain our core work and our core business because without that, food is not safe, and that has to be our first priority. And so anything more we do has got to be in addition to that, and and is not a substitution. I think you know the the board is is being very very clear on that um that said um you know food is safe <laughs> you know it should be safe not just in the next couple of days but it should be safe long term and it should be safe for the planet as well and i think it is right that um you know, the FSA plays its part in helping government meet some of the big challenges and goals it set itself. Um, so, you know, I welcome the opportunity for us to, to have these discussions. And I think the white paper that DEFRA is leading on is a real opportunity for a kind of cross-government conversation about where we want to go with food policy. Um, and given that the FSA is, is, the, is the one government department that will always put food first, um, you know, I want us to be very involved in those discussions. Um, on, the, on the data piece, um, uh, getting data from the food industry is, has always been challenging um, uh, and still is. But I think we've seen in, in other areas, and Tim will be very aware in the NHS, you know, the, the benefits that come from data, which are often greater than you imagined at, at, at the start. But I totally with you that data alone doesn't get you anywhere and you have to have that evidence, the analytic function to be able to, I think, use it not just to um, monitor progress, but also to get some insights which help you to do data-informed policymaking, smarter policymaking. So I think, you know, the, the potential is there, but realising that, as, as you say, Tim, is going to be very, very difficult. Robin, I don't know if you want to add to that. Yes, thanks. Just uh, briefly to touch on the points um, that you made about integration, Tim and, and David in particular. I mean, of course, the, the food system is hugely integrated with lots of other systems. And so I think there's a very important cross-government conversation about, for instance, how transport interacts with agriculture, interacts with food. 
Um, and the thing I would say, I think, is that FSA is extremely well placed to inform the, the consumer-based data around that. So, for instance, when people choose to buy different things, what are the wider impacts there? And there's a very active conversation, uh, particularly across government uh, science networks, about getting the evidence to make sure the decisions that happen downstream don't have unintended consequences elsewhere in the system. Emily. Thanks. Um, and just a couple of other comments to make on this. So on the data front, um, it's quite clear that there are not sufficient consistent data standards that enable food businesses to report in a consistent fashion. So, if, so for example, um, the environmental labelling conversation that's happening at the moment, um, which you know, DEFRA have just launched a consultation on some questions around that. Sorry, no, there's their, their consultation is on animal welfare labelling, forgive me. But if you look at the environmental labelling question, um, there needs to be a consistent approach to deciding what is sustainable or what is um, carbon friendly. And that underneath that question is a data question. And that, that question has not yet been answered. So that um, evidence, that, that, uh, that bit of insight is needed to be thought through. And you could apply that to a number of different aspects of, of food business work. So I think there's lots to do there. I do think it would make a, make a significant difference, though. The second thing, just to say on the legislation point, Margaret. So um, at the moment, it, it depends how big the, the um, pipeline of legislative opportunities is on food. At the moment, the pipeline is very small. Um, and because the government is busy legislating on other things. So us, uh, with our list on them, um, uh, food hygiene ratings mandation and pace powers for the National Food Crime Unit, unit and so on, we are trying to poke them through the pipeline when we get the opportunity. If, however, there were a good food bill, that would change the game on what legisl legislation um, uh, the FSA might be able to have. And, uh, you know, a, a piece of legislation that had food in the title would potentially enable us to make changes around innovation, um, uh, around operational transformation and so on. So I don't know whether that will be possible. Um, I don't know where the government will end up on that, but I, I, it would change um, the landscape a bit. And I think from the nods I see around the table, the board are very keen that we should, um, you know, as we are doing, uh, continue to have those conversations um, and, and really identify the opportunities that that would, uh, that that would bring us. Good. Uh, once again, Emily, thank you to you and to the whole of the executive team for all the work they, they do uh, on our behalf. Um, it, it never stops. Uh, in fact, at the moment, it seems to be increasing uh, uh, sort of uh, every time we meet. So thank you for that. I'm going to move us on now to the next item on the agenda, which is um, uh, an exciting new development, I think, for the, for the FSA. This relates to the annual food standards report that we have uh, previously agreed to prepare with uh, Food Standards Scotland. So this was something that was initiated by Heather Hancock, my predecessor, um, and I'm especially pleased that the uh, agreement is to do it with Food Standards Scotland very much as part of our, our sort of uh, one nation uh, approach. Uh, their board are meeting as it happens today as well, and will also be considering uh, this paper or their own version of this paper, and we'll be getting together with them swiftly afterwards to uh, you know, combine, combine insights. I do think that this reports um, an opportunity for us to set out the, the state of play, if you like, on, on food standards. And, and I think it will be something that will be of great interest to all our stakeholders. The challenge, of course, is in setting out, defining the scope of that um, uh, and ensuring that it's something uh, that, that um, uh, will, will be uh, useful to everyone. So I'm going, the, the team have been doing a huge amount of thinking about this, and um, I'm going to hand over to them now. And I think it's uh, Angela, who's the Deputy Director of um, EU Transition and the International Unit, who's going to introduce this paper, which has been put together by the, uh, by the food policy team. So Angela, thank you for joining us today. Thank, thank you, Susan, and morning, everyone. Um, so I won't say very much because you will have had sight of the ball paper, which relates to the joint FSA FSS annual report. The paper sets out the proposals on scope and approach for the joint report, our proposed plans for engagement and publication. Overall, the annual report will look at the state of the nation's plate and address whether food standards are being maintained, are falling or improving. What do I mean by this? For example, we will look at people's eating and food shopping habits consumers' concerns around food safety, 
our response to COVID-19, information and analysis and le on levels and different types of food crime, and a range of other issues are set out at paragraph 4.11. The report will be outcome focused and evidence based. It will be tightly focused to ensure we have a solid foundation for future years. The structure of the first report will not prevent us from looking at broader issues in the future. We will have the flexibility to adapt its structure going forward. Work of the annual report has been embedded in Four Nation Working and will continue to do so. The board is asked to agree the proposals for the scope of the report and the publication plans. Thank you. Gosh, thank you. That was very succinct, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm uh, confident that my board members will have, have read it in detail already. And so I'm grateful to you for, for giving us plenty of opportunity for discussion and comment. Um, who'd like to get us started on this one? David. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I agree the general thrust of this. I think it's terribly important that we have four nation working wherever, wherever we can. And I also agree that food we can trust goes much wider than mere safety. Very important though that is. So in the section called the nation's plate, we should, without necessarily endorsing all the Henry Dimbleby review conclusions, at least report on some of the areas of greatest concern to him, such as obesity and bad diets. Now, if the food we are eating and the amount of it is making us obese, then it is not food we can trust, in my opinion. And since people are getting 30% of their food from outside the home, and it's got twice the fats and calories of shop-bought food, and is not labelled, then again, in my opinion, that ain't food we can trust. So I suggest that we should always have a section on, on, on fake food, whether it's fake food from manuka honey to coffee, cheese, olive oil, and we should include takeaways where there is misrepresentation of the ingredients in food. Now, um, I, we will look uh, uh, shortly at the um, CEO report to the Business Committee, and I think that shows a rather shocking level of fraud and criminality in the food supply, and the Food Crime Unit is doing a fantastic job of tackling it. But it does show that food we can trust is under attack, constant attack, and I think we should have a section on that for all four nations as well. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, as you say, the authenticity issues is something that is addressed by the National Food Crime Unit. Um, and uh, I should also note that we'll be receiving their annual report um, at our December board meeting. So that will be an opportunity to look at that, uh, look at that in more detail there and might be, um, you know, uh, the appropriate place to do that. Rebecca, do you or Angela want to uh, comment? Well, actually, why don't we take, I can see Tim coming in. Why don't we take a, a few comments on this and then scoop them all up? Uh, sorry, not Tim, Peter. I'm sorry, apologies. Um, I, I'm going to uh, mention a few points which the Welsh Food Advisory Committee raised when they had a look at this report Thank last you. week. And uh, some of them are very specific that uh, in addition to science and uh, the evidence referred to there, it would be pertinent to take advantage of the surveillance and proactive sampling programs of the FSA. Uh, second point was um, uh, about the various departmental responsibilities. Uh, they felt that there wasn't sufficient attention to the pivotal role of local authorities. And uh, in talking about the nation's plate as if it were one, uh, the committee were very concerned about issues of, of uh, food, pov food poverty and thinking there that there are differences not just between people but between different parts of the United Kingdom, and they say it with the background that there is a high level of food poverty in Wales, and it is something which Welsh Government are giving particular attention to. So uh, perhaps some uh, recognition that there's not a general situation, and a bit more particularity would be welcomed. Uh, and the committee were interested to know how impact will be measured uh, and uh, how the report itself might be communicated to the public. 
gosh. Um, any further questions? Oh, uh, Ruth and then Colm, and then I'm going to come to Rebecca to scoop them up. Uh, well, Peter's just actually um, touched on uh, the point I was going to make about evaluation. Um, uh, just in terms of broad content, uh, I think it's really good progress. Um, it's going to be quite an interesting but time-consuming piece of work for the agency. Um, so we, we must be focused on what impact we're hoping to achieve, but building in the evaluation as the next phase of this, so we're clear in advance what we need to be monitoring in terms of its, uh, its worth, if you like. But also, we highlight this is an iterative process and therefore making sure that we do capture the learning, if you like. Cool. Sure, thank you, and thank you for the report. Um, again, I, like Peter, reflect the, some of the views of the Northern Ireland Food Advisory Committee on this. Uh, I think they were very relaxed. They, they, they saw this as a very positive uh, step forward. Uh, they would be keen to see uh, some reference to the stakeholder engagement within the report to show how, how, how broad that is and where responsibilities lie. Uh, but bearing in mind that this is the first report, uh, you, you don't have to get it perfect first time. Uh, you need to be, uh, and bear in mind that we can reflect changes as we go forward. So I think it, it, it's more important to get it written, uh, to get it out, uh, and to uh, to articulate how we got to where we got and where the evidence came from, uh, because we do have the opportunity to refine that as we move forward. I think that is a really important point, and one thing we've been clear, I think, is that this is a sort of start of a 10, really. Um, and I think it may be that it will not be as all-encompassing as, as, it, as it could be, and that we do a small number of the most pertinent issues well and illustrate the potential for this kind of report. And exactly as Ruth says, we need to learn as we go along and we will learn best if, we, uh, if we're clear what we're seeking to achieve and then whether, whether, we, whether we reach that. So I, I totally agree with those points about evaluation. I think the general comment, and I'll be interested in Rebecca's response to this, is, is how we reflect the, um, the issues in, in Wales and, and Northern Ireland. As I've mentioned, we're doing this overtly with with FSS so we need to we need to think about that um, and whether those are sort of uh, those issues issues which are specific and pertinent to one country uh, and not the others do we reflect that in an annex um, and I worry a little bit that that looks a little bit semi-detached so my preference is that that's embedded throughout the report and that I do think it is one of our one of our strengths actually um, because it um, you know it gives us a little bit of diversity we can see what's working well we've seen you know we see how some of the work on um, you know calorie wise in Northern Ireland's gone that has le lessons for the UK we've seen mandation of food hygiene ratings in Wales. So um, I would very much like us to um, really show the, the strengths of, of that approach where we have one FSA, but actually it's working very much in, in four different countries. Those, are, I guess, were the key things for me. I mean, David makes the point about us of making sure we cover the out-of-home sector and remember, you know, the whole diversity of the, of the, food, the food chain and all the different actors in it. Um, uh, and of course, local authorities are utterly crucial to our to our delivery, and we know that they're very stretched. And this may well be an opportunity for us to set out um, the, the challenges that that they're facing in relation to de to delivering on on food standards. So yes, those are some reflections from me, Rebecca. You and your team have been thinking about this. Um, I know uh, a great deal. So do you want to just give us a little, uh, yeah, your thoughts on the comments from board members? Yeah, of course. Thank you, and uh, and thank you very much for the comments. And um, and I, and I think, um, I mean, Susan, you've identified, um, you know, really clearly some opportunities we have to bring out some of those uh, distinctive aspects in the different countries of the United Kingdom. And uh, I, I'm really grateful, actually, for the input that we've had from uh, our Welsh and Northern Ireland advisory committees. I think it's really helped us to improve the, the planning and uh, to think about things in a slightly different way. And uh, I'm, you know, we, I, I think as the FSA, we're already very good at bringing in those different perspectives. I'm very confident that we'll be able to do so in this report. Um, uh, we've, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, how the, how the, um, the, the content uh, might flex where, where the highlights might be, what might be in, what we might be able to achieve in this first report. And I'm um, 
grateful. I think Ruth, um, uh, you're, you know, you, you emphasise that this is obviously the first report, and I think we've been clear in the paper. So we'll need to we'll need to choose quite carefully um, where where we do put our focus. Um, I'm really excited by the ambition of uh, of saying that we we are going to look at the nation's plate. I think that's the right ambition for, for the FSA and FSS to, to have jointly. Um, of course, within that, we'll, we'll need to build an evidence base. And I think that brings us back to some of the conversations that we've had before. And, and Susan's very clearly given her steer, uh, I know endorsed by Robin, that, that, that everything we say needs to have that firm evidence base. Um, and that's something that we may need to develop over time. So, so we'll need to choose quite carefully. Um, but those issues that have been mentioned today are, are all things where the FSA has a, a, a strong and legitimate interest around uh, nutrition, for example, where we have specific responsibilities in some parts of the United Kingdom um, around uh, food poverty uh, and consumer access to food. We've, we've done a lot of work on this over the last year in our COVID trackers where we've um, uh, got, gone into much more detail about consumer access to food in a changing social and economic environment. So these are all things that we're starting to explore and we're really looking forward to, to um, presenting them to you as we develop the first draft of the report and I think it's, it's going to be a really useful contribution from the FSA. Um, but again, this is something that uh, when we have our board retreat uh, next month, um, we'll be able to talk in more detail with the executive team and really um, uh, see how that's beginning to shape up. Um, so today what I really want is to secure the board's um, uh, agreement that, that we should continue along this, this direction of travel. I think we've given them some helpful pointers about things we're particularly concerned about and, and want to see reflected in it. Um, and um, you will have uh, further opportunities to comment on this um, as it develops. I think if we get this right, and I'm confident the team will do a very good job on this, then it will be, um, uh, I hope, will become one of those you know go to reports that people look to each year to really get a sense of you know how are our food standards holding up um, so uh, yeah very very exciting Rebecca was there anything specifically that you wanted the board to comment on today that would help your team in moving this forward no I just wanted to pick up apologies I didn't uh talk about evaluation um, but that's come up a number of times and yes of course uh, we'll be putting in place plans to, um, to to look at the impact of the report and we'll be able to uh, learn lessons from that. Okay thank you very much everyone um, yeah very very exciting. So we're going to um, turn our attention now to the Operational Transformation Programme and this is uh, absolutely at the heart of what FSA uh, do. It's an incredibly important programme. Um, we've been talking about it for a while. It's, it's been challenging to pr make progress um, over the pandemic whilst people have been, you know, very focused on, on, on doing the job today. Um, but uh, I know we have just finished the public consultation on the future delivery model. And um, so this is a really sort of watershed moment, I think, as this programme develops and very much looking forward to hearing from, from Colin and the team um, about the, uh, the, the main comments uh, that we received through the consultation and, and the next steps. So Colin, um, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Chair, and also joined by my colleague Richard Wynne Davis. Um, so, uh, just very, very briefly, then uh, some opening comments. Um, so, the, the board agreed that we'd go to consultation in May. We have done so. The, this paper is a summary of those comments. It was a very active uh, consultation exercise. We weren't passively waiting for comments, although we did receive nearly 30 written responses. Uh, but we had a series of meetings with uh, known and identified stakeholders and also with, with staff as well in trade union. And uh, just some of the emerging themes coming through, um, the importance of consumer trust and food safety and the uh, FSA's commitment to that was very clear. Uh, also, there were quite a number of comments, as you might expect, in relation to the op operational uh, pr processes that we were outlining, and there was support for the seven key elements of the model. The cost around the delivery of official controls was also raised by quite a number of stakeholders, and we recognise that in taking forward a future delivery model, we'll also need to have parallel work in terms of uh, how charging would apply to that model. Uh, and the resources in terms of staff that would be used to 
to be deployed on the model was also a, a common theme. And we are looking as part of the ops transformation program at how we would resource our official controls after the current uh, contract with service delivery partner um, from April 2023. Another emerging uh, theme was the use of data and the importance of accuracy, uh, both in terms of public health and also to assure animal welfare, something which we're uh, very alive to. And the importance of supporting trade and uh, quite a, a number of uh, respondents also mentioned the, the possibility of divergence across the four countries of the UK uh, from uh, the operational transformation program and, and uh, application of this new model, which is something we need to be alive to. Um, but in overall terms, I should say that there was very broad support for the future delivery model um, and its constituent parts uh, as a framework upon which to build. We recognize that in building that framework, that there would be many elements that we would return to the board uh, to uh, bring our thoughts and our proposals. And then also then finally, just in, in summary, uh, the paper also covers our work program for the next 12 months, uh, in particular in uh, paragraph 9.3, we reference the main activities that we're planning to progress subject to board approval. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. And I should um, perhaps note for the board that although it's not been formally logged as part of the consultation, um, of course, this has been um, a topic which has been very prominent in lots of the introductory meetings that I've had with, uh, with stakeholders. And I think the, the views that have come through the more formal consultation process largely reflect uh, what I've heard. Um, I think it perhaps is important to note that some of the comments I've heard from stakeholders and indeed from some of our own staff, you know, is a reminder that this program is something we're doing to um, enable us to work more efficiently and more effectively, to make better use of data, to make better use of technology um, and, and to deliver really evidence based interventions. Um, it's, it's about enhancing our ability to keep food safe. It's, it's not about trying to cut corners. Um, and I think that's really important that people understand that, um, you know, the board are only going to support this if it's making things better. Um, and, uh, you know, I've seen some examples, that are some little insights into that, and I am genuinely excited um, about this. I think it will allow us to achieve genuinely better regulation and, and, and better outcomes. Um, so what I'd really like um, to hear from the board is, is, is your response to those, those consultation points and perhaps also particularly to uh, comment on the, on the deliverables over, over the, next, the next 12 months. Um, this is something that's going to come back to the board repeatedly over the next few years. But again, I think one of the concerns I've heard from stakeholders is, oh, you say this is a five-year programme, you know, and, and everybody worries that somehow nothing's going to happen for five years and nothing could be further from the truth. This is an ongoing, evolving programme. There's some pilot work already um, in, in place. Um, but I'd really like to hear from the board whether you're content with the, with the pace and the, of, of the, that's set out here for the next, for the next 12 months. Tim. Thank you. I really welcome the report and, and the progr progress that uh, is planned. Um, I, the comments I wanted to make were just about uh, official controls and capacity and sustainability. Um, uh, somebody, and I'll declare the interest in, who's in, involved in red meat production and who sees some of this firsthand, um, I think there is a real challenge ahead. The um, profile of meat processing is changing as demand changes, um, both post-COVID and Brexit, uh, people looking at shorter supply chains, um, sometimes looking for more local solutions, um, and also uh, different models of provision through some of the larger plants. And I think that creates challenges for us. So any change or development in what we do has to be sensitive to that. Um, I think that um, Keeping the confidence of veterinary professionals um, and maintaining the interest in their provision as part of a balanced portfolio is going to be incredibly important. Um, this is a vital function. It's vital to the food industry, but it's also an integral part of how veterinarians actually learn a part of a wider range of skills, and I think that has a broader value. So I'd hope those things could be taken into account and we have, if you like, a weather eye on some of the operational 
issues, particularly as they relate to relationships as well, because those relationships between OVs and um, the plants they work in uh, are incredibly important to secure confidence, not only for the consumer, but also to, get, to have the authority of those OVs in how they operate within the plants. Um, and those uh, relationships sometimes take some time to develop. So if we chop and change things, then that can actually undermine that. So I think, again, it's about having that on the ground insight. So in summary, very much welcome the direction of travel, um, very much welcome uh, continued support in this area because it's needed, but also looking for that sensitivity about how we operationalize so that we don't lose some very valid parts of the system. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. And your point about the very varying nature of, uh, of these businesses is, you know, absolutely resonates with me, having visited both a mobile abattoir and a very large um, abattoir in, in, in the last few months. And I think, um, you know, clearly what works for one may not be appropriate for the other. Um, and, you know, that those lessons from people on the ground, I've learned hugely just on those visits, talking to people who are in the plants, who, who see better than anybody what what's working well and, and what isn't and so I'm really pleased actually that the sort of co-production that's been built in and in fact it, you know one of the few good things to come out uh, through the pandemic has been the level of communication that we've had between the agency and and the businesses because um, there's been an absolute you know need to work together and that's something that I think everybody's very committed to continuing going forward. Um, I'm going to take this quite a few comments. What I'll do is I'll scoop them up and then, Colin, I'll come back to you. But I can see you're making notes, so keeping an, a neat uh, list. So Mark first and then Margaret and then Peter. Thank you, Susan. Um, just to address your, your question, first of all, around uh, the staged approach and whether that's appropriate, I think it is. Um, I can see all sorts of difficulties in trying to do a big bang approach with this level of change. Um, I suppose what I would seek, though, is some reassurance that the stages are prioritised in an order that means that we get the most impact earlier on, uh, rather than leave the high impact items till the end, where that's possible. It so may not be. Um, just a couple of other comments from, from the consultation itself. Um, in the challenges section, I know you've got a section around smaller businesses. Um, this is an area that uh, always concerns me, that we imply that big businesses because they have resources should perhaps have a lower regulatory burden um, that troubles me i think the uh, the reach and the risk pr pr proposed by big businesses means that we should expect them to have a higher compliance uh, involvement and investment um, so i i think that is an appropriate challenge small businesses perhaps need support big businesses uh, we should have high expectations of their ability to comply uh, in my view uh, and just another reflection, the consumer awareness uh, comes out from this, that there is a, a limited amount of awareness of consumers about these controls, but a very clear desire to maintain and enhance standards. And I just wonder if there's something in this programme that can be used to uh, perhaps enhance consumer trust in this space. Margaret. Um, fascinating, detailed, clear paper. Um, and I think um, we're getting to the stage where we need to give support and impetus for some of the more difficult, possibly contentious um, areas um, of this whole project. Things like segregation, how we um, try and tailor, make future um, delivery options and a regulation for different segments of the industry, um, which Mark has just touched on, and, and by ensuring that data is consistent. Um, I think the future has to be about the introduction, pushing on of smart technologies. Big, some of the big businesses are already doing this. Um, it can allow us all, industry and us, to provide more accurate information about the food that's being produced, uh, looking at the good, uh, finding out what's not so good. Um, it does not mean the end of the vets, absolutely not all the meat inspectors. We're going to need them to help us make this transition. They're going to have to go in physically uh, to deal with the non-compliant operators. They're going to be needed to train new vets, uh, although um, in the younger ones coming in are going to have uh, a bigger emphasis on the technological side and the more remote side. Um, that's inevitably going to happen. Um, 
I think that um, once we all begin to understand this, we can start thinking about the detail of that new delivery model. And I notice in the consultation that the, um, there is frustration by industry and by consumers, both on the same side on this, uh, at the lack of detail about that future delivery model. And um, I think we're getting to the stage where we can't s simply say, once we've got consensus on other things, then we'll address this. So uh, my question is, when can we um, uh, start seeing details of options for a future delivery model? Obviously, you're not going to give us one and say that's it. Um, and when do you think we're going to start seeing smarter, more accurate collection of data, which will enable us to um, target the different types of um, operators so that we can get more appropriate regulation. Um, one further comment, this, you, meant, you touch on a two-tier regulatory system for imports, exports. Personally, I am slightly reluctant on that. I prefer to see you know, the one system and then you tweak it um, um, as it changes, and especially when we have to take into um, account the Northern Ireland Protocol and the differences we already have. Um, there and divergence there. And I think um, it's not going to be easy, um, but we need to push ahead now um, because this modernization of the industry is really needed. Thank you, Margaret. Um, Peter. The very large scale change uh, has many, many problems, and we are certainly facing them not least in the scale, the differences of scale of the businesses with which we're dealing, and uh, you've already brought that out. When the Welsh Food Advisory Committee looked at this, uh, they looked at the stakeholder list, uh, people who had been consulted, involved in the consultation, uh, and saw lots of representative bodies but with an emphasis on the large scale. Uh, and the kind of thing that was mentioned was organic farming, uh, the small scale and artisan producers, and the need to take account of that scale of business in the nature of uh, the way you carry out the future delivery model. Broadly, there was a lot of support for going forward in this direction, the future delivery model concept itself, uh, and the broad proposals. The committee also wanted to see a little more analysis of uh, risks in four-country divergence, which we know that there are, there's a, a lot of work, emphasis, uh, at a political level in talking about common standards and so on. But um, the risks need to be assessed and built in uh, because uh, if there were to be significant divergences, we may have to do something rather different in different places. Thank you, Peter. And uh, I think divergence is something we're very conscious of in, in you know, e sort of every piece of our work these days. Um, uh, I think it was Colm next and David. If I can ask you to be pretty snappy. And then yeah. thanks. Uh, thank you, Chair. And, and again, thank you, uh, Colin and the team, for the paper. Uh, the, uh, I'm just interested in the, the engagement. I'm delighted to see that there's been strong engagement with the Northern Ireland uh, red meat industry. Um, uh, and, and Margaret's already referenced particularly keen to avoid a two or a perception of a two-tier system uh, which would be uh, disadvantageous in the view of, of the industry in, in Northern Ireland as we're interested in what you have to say about that. I, I, I'm, I'm very keen to uh, to know what we're doing about accessing an ongoing pool of OVs and MHIs. You know, things are going to change for them in terms of the roles, particularly, uh, and it's how we, we keep them on board. Uh, we are very aware of the age profile of our MHIs, particularly, uh, and, and the changing skill sets. So it's something we just need to be alive to, uh, because while there, there will be technological solutions, that does not take away from human uh, interventions as well. So we just need to, need to manage that and, and how we're going to, uh, because we have had difficulties, as we know, over the course of the year with, with some of the inspection 
activities uh, and then uh, finally I, I suppose at what point do we get to the discussion uh, of the cost management uh, in other words where will the costs uh, be put together for all of this uh, and uh, are we having those discussions at this stage with all parts of the uh, the industry yeah. uh, thank you chair as a new board member, I've had to swat up on this operational transformation program, and I'm absolutely convinced it's the right way to go, it's the right direction of travel, and we must push on as quickly as resources allow, and we can possibly do it. However, in physical discussions recently with meat hygiene inspectors and some online discussions, the, exp the experienced one said that they supported the future delivery model, but it was vital that senior management um, kept taking input from them since they had the experience on the ground and they could help to make it work because they're 30 years experience. Now, it's a very pretty infographic we've got on page two of the report um, showing the theoretical working, but there were only six internal consultations out of 41 ex and 41 external ones, and not many of those internal ones seem to involve MHIs. I apologize if I got that wrong. And I'm slightly biased, but I sometimes think that we old hands have got a bit of experience we can offer the smart young things. So I hope that um, the, the senior management will involve the old hands, uh, men and women amongst the uh, meat hygiene inspectors, and ask for their input to make the thing work on the ground. Right, Colin, quite a list for you there. Uh, yes, thank you very much, uh, Board, and thank you for your level of engagement and interest in this paper. It's tremendous, and we're very encouraged by it. Um, I hope I've captured all these comments. If I, if I, if I don't, um, please, please come back. And, Richard, you might want to pick up some other uh, additional comments in relation to what um, we, we will cover. So, first of all, um, Tim absolutely completely agree that we need to de deal with this in a very sensitive way, take account of... Uh, the professions and work with them rather than against them, and that's definitely the, the tenor of our discussions. And uh, a bespoke approach for different um, abattoirs, different sizes, uh, cutting plants or, 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 or slaughterhouses or whatever. And we've really found that the account management system, which uh, Susan mentioned in her introduction, has been really, really helpful during COVID, but it's also been really, really helpful in terms of engaging with, um, with different uh, abattoirs across the, the system. So we, we will we'll use that as a continue to use that as a vehicle for engagement. Um, in, in terms of um, Mark's comments around a staged approach, absolutely want to have the big bang uh, items first. I think the big bang, however, will come through legislative change, and that will, there will be a delay there. But nonetheless, we are we are looking to see what we can do with the existing um, legislation uh, in the paper. It's highlighted what we're going to be doing uh, this coming year, and your your concerns around. Um, what is best for different sizes of abattoirs, I think it has always got to come back to what it, the risk-based approach, irrespective of the size, the level of risk, whether it's uh, the, the different species, whether it's the different levels of throughput, or indeed the different levels of compliance. So we, I think we need to build into that, uh, all of that into our segmentation model, which we are doing. And whilst we're coming today to, to talk to the board about the future delivery model, there's other work happening in parallel that you haven't been cited on in detail. We will come back to that. So this isn't a, it isn't a sequential thing that we, uh, yes, we need to get the board to agree to the platform before we build on it, but we are continuing to develop some of the, that other structure and we'll come back to you in, in due course. Um, and and the, the, another thing that we're doing uh, in parallel, uh, to, to, and Colin mentioned this, is around charging. Uh, so uh, that's also in train. Um, uh, and Margaret's comments around smart technology and, and data, absolutely, they're very important. And uh, we, in no way are we saying that this is the end of VETS or MHIs in, 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 in this sector at all. Um, OV resourcing, it, uh, the, that's an element of this program. Uh, how we staff up the future delivery model subject to approval is, is very important. And we have a, a project within the program to look at that, given the... the um, the, the pressures of, of needing to have decisions before um, we get to the end of the current contract. So that, that work is, is ongoing and we'll be coming back with, with options as to how we, how we propose uh, to, uh, to take that forward beyond uh, April 2023. Um, and then in terms of um, Peter's comments, um, uh, thank you for that in terms of the, uh, the, who we engage with. I should say that engagement, uh, what we've reported on in this paper is the eight weeks of formal engagement from the end of May to the end of July. That engagement continues. And Richard, perhaps you could touch on some of the other bodies that we've been talking to subsequently. 
Um, and, and you mentioned uh, organic farming, artisan producers, and so on. That's really important that we get all of that, not just the very big producers, uh, or some of the the, um, the uh, producers that are represented by the, meat, the main meat trade bodies. Um, so, and then, um, and then, um, Colin's comments in relation to the two-tier potential possibility of a two-tier approach. Um, I think we are looking at the possibility of doing things different in different parts of the UK. The key element to this program has to be that the outcomes are no different uh, in terms of food safety, uh, animal welfare, uh, public health. Um, and, and you mentioned again about OVs and MHIs, and, how, and I, I hope I've addressed that in terms of how we're taking that forward and the, the timing around that. Um, and then um, finally, I think, if I hope I haven't missed anyone, um, David's comments in relation to uh, engaging with our staff, that, that is absolutely central. There were six engagements again during that eight week period. I, I and my colleagues in the senior team have regular engagement with our field ops colleagues. Um, we often have, um, well, we always have a, a colleague from ops transformation in the, in the evening sessions that we, we engage with colleagues who are frontline staff who can't be there um, during during the day, um, we also have regular three weekly meetings with Unison, the main trade the main trade union. And um, just last week, we we met. Uh, Emily presented to the Association of Meat Inspectors. Richard and I presented on ops transformation. So we are we are keeping this engagement going. We absolutely see that this is about enhancing the role of meat hygiene inspectors not doing away with meat hygiene inspectors, but actually giving them a more enhanced and, and added value role. So that, that's where, I, uh, that's a summary. I think, I hope I've ca captured all the comments. Uh, I think, if, if, if I may, actually, I think that that's a good summary. I think, uh, you know, in the interest of time, we won't go any further. I think what you've heard is um, broad support from the board. Um, and indeed in the consultation for the for the direction of travel here and for the future future delivery model. I think you've heard very firmly about how much value we place on, on co-production. Um, you know, that's essential in any organizational change, certainly of, of this of this scale. And you know, I think we want to be very you know, we are reassured, but that's important that, that this continues um, throughout it. I think the outstanding bit, you know, so we're all talking, the theory is fantastic, we're all agreed with it, we're all signed up to it, but what people are looking for now is is what is the future delivery model going to look like, and I think the sooner we can see a kind of straw man of, of, of that, the better, or options for that, because the devil is in the detail, and when people have got it in front of them, then it's it's much, I think we'll, we will hone in much faster rather than just talking about the about the generics of it and i think what will be very helpful in that is when we've got the results from some of the pilots that i know you're running and i've been able to see a little bit of of what's emerging from that but i'd really um, encourage you to be uh, uh, writing those up or presenting them in ways that other people can see because i think actually they are in many ways very very reassuring and they're also exciting because I think they show show the real potential and I think it'd be much much easier to bring people along when they see some evidence uh, from, from the pilots so I, th I think getting that pilot data out and coming forward with what is what are the options for the future delivery model in a more tangible way is, is what we want to see next few nods around the table um, around that but thank you this is a huge amount of work and um, you know we're we're yeah very very uh, pleased to see it going forward in this way and great leadership thank you okay um, let's move on now to the next item on the agenda we've got uh, all sorts of things which we've got uh, lots to say this is very topical um, uh, item around genome editing. Um, so uh, members of the board and, and those watching will be aware that there was a DEFRA consultation uh, recently and we've been in close contact with DEFRA um, on, this, uh, on this matter. Um, I'm going to, I think that uh, it's Michael White who's going to, oh, Rebecca's going to introduce this item and then perhaps we'll draw in other members of her team. And during the course of this, if I can just remind Rebecca to respond to the two questions that were presented at the start of the meeting uh, in relation to this item. Thank you. 
Yeah, thank you, Chair. I thought actually I might start by responding very briefly, as I think at least one of those will give us a nice uh, lead into the paper. So I'll do that and then I'll hand over to Michael for a brief introduction. So we have uh, two questions for response in the meeting. I'd like to um, start with a question from Dr. Tina Barsby, who are, who's asked why we don't make reference to the regulatory framework uh, for new conventionally bred plant varieties. Um, so the simple answer is that the paper is obviously focused on the FSA's regulatory responsibility, uh, which is why we've highlighted novel foods and animal feed regimes. It's absolutely right to note that there are other regulatory processes in place, um, such as the one mentioned by Dr. Barsby. Um, these are within DEFRA's remit rather than that of the FSA, but it's really useful to be reminded about how the different regulatory regimes may relate to each other, um, and that's something I'm sure we'll, we'll um, be able to discuss as, as part of the, um, this agenda item. Uh, the second question from uh, Samantha Brook, Chief Executive of the British Society of Plant Breeders, uh, is a question about various statements that have been made about safety here. Um, it, it's absolutely true to say that, that some changes made by gene editing may pose no greater risk than changes made by traditional breeding. Um, but as we've highlighted in the paper, the risk relates to the outcome as well as the process. It may change uh, depending on the size and the site of the edit. And safety is not just about how the food or feed is produced, it's also about the characteristics and use of the product. Um, and that's why, uh, amongst others, our own uh, independent advisory committee on novel foods and processes has advised that safety assessments on gene edited products will need to be made on a case by case basis. So, so both statements are true. Uh, some gene edited pro products may pose no greater risk, uh, but the FSA cannot provide a comprehensive. Uh, statement of safety covering all outcomes from gene editing techniques. Uh, and obviously we want to ensure that the regulatory regime is proportionate to the risk uh, and that I think leads us nicely into the discussion of today's board paper. So I'd like to hand over now to Michael White uh, to give a very brief introduction to the paper. Thank you. Michael, over to you. Thank you and uh, good morning everyone. Um, so this paper considers the implications for the FSA of DEFRA's proposals on gene editing. The paper raises a number of points about the regulatory impact of excluding gene edit, edited products from current leg legislation on genetically modified foods and feed. Notes potential impacts on other nations of the United Kingdom, sets out the results of FSA consumer research, and discusses early thinking around how gene edited products might best be regulated in a proportionate manner. The board is particularly asked Agree that there's a case for updating regulation to reflect new scientific and technical innovation in gene editing, to comment on the principles identified in the paper at paragraph 311, that will help inform the FSA's response, uh, and that we continue to seek a coherent and proportionate GB-wide approach for regulating GE products, subject to the government's response to the consultation, which we understand is due soon. So I'll, I'll leave that uh, brief introduction there um, and uh, look forward to hearing the board discussion on this. Thank, Thank you, you, Michael. That was very helpful. Um, I think the first item on that, which was the case for updating the regulatory frameworks, is one that we have considered many times, and I think we all do recognise that, that change is needed. Um, and so I guess I'd like to um, focus the board's efforts on, on the nature of that change, and in particular the principles that we should use to, to guide uh, this uh, uh, regulation of, of gene-edited food, and indeed feed products um, as well. Mark. Thank you, Susan. Um, just two reflections from, from my point of view, if I may. Firstly, uh, if this does come about, there's going to be a uh, significant need for public engagement in, in this if we want to ensure that the food which results from this is still food that is trusted. Um, uh, and I don't think that can be underplayed. I think that's a really important uh, viewpoint, uh, just for us and for DEFRA, actually. Um, my second point is more specific. Uh, in the traceability section in 3.11, it talks about uh, needing to consider uh, aspects of this for enforcement. Um, I would urge, if this change comes about, that actually the need for enforcement is not an afterthought, that it's actually built in from the start. Um, regulations which are enacted without thought for how they're complied with and how they're enforced actually have very limited value. Um, so the, enforce the way that these are going to be enforced uh, needs to be considered from the very start, not as an afterthought. 
that's a wise word. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to come to Tim next, and then I very specifically, Peter, will come to you and to Colm um, to hear the views from from your committees and uh, from from Wales Northern Ireland. Tim, thank you very much for that, and thank you for the the, the presentation as well. Um, I think this opens up a lot of uncertainty for people, um, but also I think there's a there's a lot of uh, promise in the fact that this is a significant leap in genetic science. Um, that step forward from genetic manipulation techniques of the 1980s uh, has happened, and it opens up a whole range of new scientific prospects, but also questions that I think we need to be honest about in the context of food we can trust. And I welcome Mark's comments around the practical issues as much as the points of principle. I think what's concerned people is whether or not this is a move to uh, having very light regulation to almost be non-existent and I think we're dead well I would hope we're not in that place I don't reinterpret that we're in that place I think this is about reshaping regulation to best befit the developments in technology and science however uh, technology doesn't always move uh, in a coordinated way because uh, whilst we have an ability to be very specific in uh, genetic uh, editing, we don't necessarily have the techniques always to be able to te detect where that has occurred or indeed where the very rare events of non-specific or non-targeted edits may happen within the genome. And we need to be candid about that. I do think uh, it is low, but then low and rare events genetically can have consequences. Indeed, the edits themselves are evidence of that. So I think we move forward. I think we have uh, a situation where we do um, uh, invoke a new uh, and more befitted uh, regulation system, but one that also looks forward to further developments in gene genetic technology, for example, epigenetics. I think there are challenges ahead so that we get that properly shaped and formulated, but I do welcome the direction of travel, and I uh, really welcome the way the FSA has stepped up to giving its views on it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Peter and then Colm. Um, <laughs> the Welsh Committee picked up immediately on the issue of public trust and uh, the whole business of public understanding in this field as one of the greatest dangers that we face. And uh, that public messaging about the whole thing is something which isn't just our responsibility, of course. Others have got to step up and do their work in this so that this is not seen as being something driven by the FSA, but we are carrying out our responsibilities and in the way that we put this across, in carrying public confidence, we need to show that the factors that uh, people will be reassured by, adequate information out there, uh, traceability and uh, the sort of issues that we know that we're already talking about, that we're already keen to see, that those are built in to the way that the legislation goes through, uh, the way in which we regulate, that it is in a public trust through seeing that we are doing the job thoroughly and in a precautionary way, a balanced proportionary way, and uh, one which reflects the various differences between uh, very simple gene editing on the one hand uh, and more complicated stages uh, on the other. Um, the other points the committee was uh, keen to explore uh, how the differences between uh, UK regime and what's happening in the EU and internationally 
would fit in and how we were going to align. Now, I know that that's very much, again, a matter that uh, uh, FSA is uh, very alert to working on, uh, and the committee was reassured about that kind of thing. And the other is that uh, there are, of course, differences between the attitudes of the regimes of the governments in the different parts of the United Kingdom uh, and of civil society. And uh, the precautionary approach, ang approach angle uh, is certainly one which is very strong in Wales and needs to be taken account of. But overall, the committee uh, welcomed the work that uh, FSA is doing in this field. Thank you, Peter. Colm. Chair, thank you, and, and thank you guys for the for the paper. I, I think uh, the the main reflection from the Northern Ireland Food Advisory Committee was sort of the lack of reference to Northern Ireland within the paper till we got to page paragraph three twenty one, and we got the one mention in, in, in that there were some very serious concerns uh, around the impact of GE with Northern Ireland not involved, and we we don't know where the EU are uh, from a time perspective on all of this. But it's the impact, particularly uh, on feed and seed uh, in, in in Northern Ireland, which is largely sourced currently from uh, other parts of, of the UK. Uh, and it's just given our, our, our unique position of still being under EU regulation uh, and, and the potential conflict that that raises again with the UK internal market bill. Uh, and it's not just in relation to the food and feed products themselves, but also their broader impact on the food chain. Uh, so as the feed moves through the food chain, as the, as the seed moves through the food chain. And, and I suppose it was co concerning that this was probably the first real sign of post-Brexit divergence uh, and the impacts that that's going to have for us as, as the Food Standards Agency. So I suppose the question coming through from, from the uh, while welcoming the direction of travel, I mean, you're not going to stop gene editing, it's, 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 it's a reality. Uh, and it's a good thing that, that the UK is in the forefront of that. But have we fully thought through the implications for us as a, a, the FSA as a regulator when it comes to, to, to Northern Ireland? David. Yes, uh, very briefly, Chair, and following on from what uh, Colm and, and, and um, uh, uh, Peter have just said, I endorse, entirely endorse the approach here, particularly the principles set out in, in chapter in, in section 311. I think it's terribly important um, that we try and work in harmony as far as we possibly can with all four countries of the United Kingdom. I think we can all guess or speculate that this is likely to happen. Gene editing is likely to happen in England. And I think we should do some preliminary work on contingency planning if Scotland and Wales in particular take a different point of view for perfectly legitimate reasons. And I think we should do a little bit of thinking on how we're going to handle that in the future. Margaret. I suppose uh, the trouble with that is that uh, I worry that we're going to be at odds with other people and that can limit exports, which is kind of where columns have been coming from. So all those points about that and Northern Ireland have been covered. Um, I think our attitude should be very precautionary. I'm absolutely pro-scientific development for the better of society, but I think here we've got to be cautious. There are still questions, um, not less about the process of the genetic editing, more about what happens afterwards, the ex effect it may have, for example, on the environment. So I think any decisions or advice we give have got to be underpinned by really clear science, which of course we always do, um, and followed by traceability, which is much more difficult, and clear labelling. Um, I'm going to just turn to Ruth now. Just to um, put on record that I, I do recognise that we need to move on. We need a new framework. Um, I think the first option is is the pragmatic way forward. There are some real challenges about actually designing a regulatory framework. Traceability has been mentioned. Um, so there's lots of detail work to be done in advance of that. Um, and I think just echo, uh, we have to proceed at the pace at which consumers understand what's happening. And uh, we work in public interest and consumer interest. Uh, and protect the public's health. So there are so many questions that we need to address as we go forward. So the biggest challenge, I think, for us is to make sure that people understand what a new regulatory framework is actually giving them in terms of that confidence, that trust in, in food. Um, so I think the general sense I have is that people are, have a, a, a precautionary risk appetite at this stage. As uh, science develops, we may need to review that as we go forward, but we're at the early stage of this process, I think. 
Thank you. Um, I mean, I think what, you know, we recognise that in a way DEFRA is in the lead on this and we're, we're waiting to hear from them. But I think it's really important that all this preparatory work has been done because this is going to be going to be complex. Um, the board is clearly very supportive of us reshaping the, the regulation. I think the idea of going for your first approach, uh, the, the, the first uh, uh, step is, is the one we favour at the moment, recognising this is going to change over time and we need to, we need to learn and evolve this uh, as, as we go um, and, and to our very best efforts to try and future-proof the, the system. I think everybody has echoed this issue of uh, consumer trust and confidence in the food system being absolutely fundamental and therefore the pace needs to be determined by that. But that does bring it really into the heart of our, of our territory in terms of our, our connection and communication with consumers. And I think that whilst absolutely, Ruth, I hear your comments about we, we must listen, we absolutely must do that, but we also need to ensure that we are informing consumers in a way where they can understand because there is nothing more worrying than not understanding uh, what, what this is about. Um, and, you know, the science is, com is, is complex. Um, so I think our scientific evidence base is, is absolutely fundamental to this and the way we communicate that is is absolutely vital too and I guess given that I'm very conscious that we're we're short of time but I think this is such an important issue I'm just going to ask Robin really to to comment on this because he's been doing a tremendous amount of, of work on it already thank you chair yes absolutely so I just I'll keep my comments very brief but firstly to pick up on the point that Rebecca made at the beginning which I think is absolutely key uh, there is a clear distinction between the technology and the product that it produces and we need to consider both of those in terms of uh, potential risk and benefit um, so that that's the first point the second point that's been raised by several board members around public engagement absolutely uh, we've been very involved uh, with the whole agency and uh, me in particular through uh, people like the Nuffield County for bioethics in terms of public consultation but also in consulting with scientific colleagues um, in this field uh, about not only what is in development now but what may be on the horizon in the future uh, because I think it's very important firstly to understand uh, what it is that people want to know what it is that they uh, would like to appraise in terms of making decisions about food but also that we build a regulatory framework that is fit not just for today but for what may be coming in 18 months time or two years time uh, so there's a lot of active engagement there and I think the last point to make there again is is that first and foremost in terms of appraising uh, the impacts in, in health and in, in benefit um, there is a clear scientific rationale uh, for each decision we make but second to that is is the recognition the clear recognition that people may have uh, other reasons for wanting to choose uh, to eat particular things or not eat particular things which is the point that, that Margaret and Ruth made um, and so that issue of traceability labeling and, and a clear distinction so that people can uh, make their own choices is, is really critical and that requires both a kind of very close public engagement and a close update in terms of the science so that we can have the sort of evidence base to trace uh, such products as they enter the market in due course. Thank you, Robin. Um, and so I, I think the one uh, point that I didn't pick up on is this potential for divergence. And, um, you know, this is something that we're very vigilant to across across all of all of our work. And it may be that this gives us a particular opportunity to do a little bit of scenario planning and, and just thinking through what might the implications for that be if we were to find ourselves in a situation. So I think that that's perhaps something we should we should look at. Um, Thank you all. That was a very rich um, discussion and I think it's been very helpful sort of taking the temperature. In the end, I think the message I'm hearing from the board is, is that whilst we can comment, it's actually not our views which matter, it's the views of the public and that uh, we need to keep that uppermost in our mind and, and for us to do everything we can to uh, provide the evidence uh, that they need. Um, and also the the you know it, uh, communicate that information uh, in, in a in a way which uh, allows them to make informed informed choices um, and to have confidence in in the systems and the uh, that we've put in place. Okay, uh, you've all worked very hard this morning. Um, I think we deserve a very short, uh, very short break. We are a little bit behind, so I suggest we just take 10 minutes and then we resume again very promptly at, um, at 10.55. Thank you very much. 
So welcome back everybody and we're now at the agenda item where we hear from the uh, director from Wales and from the Welsh Food Advisory Committee. Um, I should note that you'll have seen in my list of engagements that I was very pleased to meet with Leslie Griffiths and Lynn Neagle um, uh, from the Welsh Government in, in the first few weeks of my time with the, with the FSA and I also met with the uh, Chief Veterinary Officer and the CMO uh, just, just last week. Um, as I mentioned at the start, um, I'm very much hoping we'll hold our next board meeting in Cardiff and there'll be an opportunity to meet uh, face to face uh, with some of our stakeholders there and of course with, with our staff from the office um, in Wales. Um, I'm uh, going to hand over in the first instance I think to uh, Nathan Barnhouse who's the director for Wales who's going to give us a summary of uh, his report um, and then I'll turn to Peter Price who um, chairs the Welsh Food Advisory Committee. Thank you. Nathan. Bardag, good morning. Um, I'll keep my remarks quite short because the paper should be fairly self-explanatory. Um, I hope the paper sets out for you a little bit more around how one FSA working happens, uh, particularly in Wales in my paper. Um, I just want to mention that this last year has been particularly marked by the challenges of the pandemic and recognition of how the staff in the Cardiff office in Wales really stepped up, but also how our colleagues in local authorities and in other partner organisations also stepped up and we really uh, changed the way we share information to the better. Um, I'm quite proud of a success we had over the last year where we had one member of staff under a multi-agency agreement loaned to local authorities to support the recovery, uh, the response process. Um, and the paper finishes off just looking ahead at the priorities for the coming year. Um, recovery is obviously going to be one of our most important focuses and the work we do with our partners in local authorities. We will also be focusing on the post-EU exit uh, work that we'll be taking on and working with the Welsh Government not only on their review but also on how we can align ourselves to the new programme of government. And finally, uh, given that this is a new session of the Senate, we'll be stepping up our engagement with Assembly members or members of the Senate uh, so that they uh, fully understand how we work and operate in Wales. That's great. Thank you, Nathan. And um, uh, yes, just to put the board will, will be aware, but just a reminder to those who are, who are watching in that um, we are there is going to be a review of the work of the FSA in Wales and we're working very closely with them to um, uh, you know, uh, discuss what we do and think about the future opportunities. Um, Peter, firstly, uh, thank you so much for all the work you do uh, and indeed to members of, of your committee. I think it's a real um, asset to, to this board um, to be able to draw not only on your knowledge of what's going on in Wales, but also to bring in those views of, views of wider stakeholders. So thank you for that. Well, thank you very much. And uh, in terms of the wide stakeholders, perhaps I'll pick that up straight away and say that... Uh, We've recently undertaken a recruitment campaign when the terms of office of some of the members came to an end. We've recruited four new members this year and uh, what we have seen is uh, adding to the strength of the committee by recruiting people from different backgrounds, each of whom is a major contributor to our work because of the background from which they come and the, what they can draw on in uh, their experience. Um, the committee itself uh, uh, meets regularly with two types of meetings. Uh, one type is very straightforward and that is before each board meeting when the papers are available the week before the committee meets and looks at each of those board papers. And we're very grateful to uh, members of the FSA top team who have uh, participated online, of course, in the last year um, through uh, those meetings. And so there is an engagement by the members of the committee with people who are right there on the front line. That's very much appreciated and enables a lot more than just what is reported to the board. Uh, that engagement, the interaction is uh, a very much of value. The other type of meeting we call a themed meeting 
and its purpose really is for the committee to have a very good grasp of the food system in Wales, the various distinctive uh, issues that are arising uh, and will arise, and uh, you will see in paragraph uh, 73 uh, a list of the uh, themes that we've dealt with. The future food system in Wales, changes in the Welsh food landscape, EU exit, COVID and other causes, uh, the achieving business compliance programme, although we considered it in terms of board papers, we also had a, a specific uh, session early on on that, uh, and an overview of the food hygiene rating scheme. So all of those are valuable in uh, ensuring the committee is well informed and then the, the committee can pass on uh, informed opinions to this board. Uh, that's my report. Thank you. And of course, we, uh, you know, we hear much of the comments of those committees as we run through each of the uh, each of the agenda items. So uh, thank you for that. Um, could I ask if other members of the board have particular questions uh, about any of the work that specifically uh, pertains to Wales? Colm. Sure. It, it, it's not a question, it's really just a comment just to reflect the views of the, uh, the Northern Ireland Food Advisory Committee when we discussed that and they just wanted me to pass on uh, the appreciation of the Northern Ireland Food Advisory Committee for the work that's done in Wales and for keeping us informed particularly in relation to the differences from Welsh Government. Thank you both. Great. Uh, Ruth. Why don't you go first? And well, Jochemar Nathan, uh, thank you, Nathan, for, for the report and, and Peter also. Um, obviously, it's uh, really helpful to see the scope of work that's been going on. Um, I was particularly interested in the programme for government that's been published. Um, and you've highlighted two areas where the FSA can contribute to the work of the, the Welsh Government. Um, my sense also is that there's a strong emphasis on sustainability. Uh, built into the programme for government covering a whole range of issues. I just wanted to check whether you feel that wider uh, push on climate change and sustainability has any other implications for uh, the way we work up to clean Wales. Anything else that you're anticipating in that context? Thank you. Nathan, do you want to respond to that and then I'll come to Emily. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. Um, I think we're very fortunate in Wales in that we're extremely familiar with working um, under the principles of the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which the board itself has uh, noted. Um, I think we're actually well placed through our connections to make the links um, more broadly, not just in the areas that are completely obvious to us in relation to food, but those areas where our expertise and advice can support the Welsh Government in driving forward its policy programmes. Um, we, we explore those openly with the Welsh Government and we then take that feedback back into our own policy development processes. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I introduced Julie Pierce at the start of the meeting, who has many roles, but one of them is uh, is uh, with responsibility for Wales. Julie's joining us um, uh, online and I'm just going to invite in at this point. Julie. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yes, um, that is... One of my roles is um, ensuring the um, oversight of Wales and all of our work within Wales is um, brought to the top table um, to the rest of the executive. Um, but the point I was just picking up on in answer to um, Ruth's question is, um, yes, absolutely, we are very strongly engaged with the um, the interaction, the intersection between food and the rest of the environment in, in Wales. I'm speaking, for example, at the Blast Cymru conference in a, in a few weeks' time um, and talking there about the opportunities that we have with, with the data and being able to see those interconnections through the lens of data um, and also with the um, academic community within Wales. Um, we've got some strong relationships with um, a number of the universities operating in this sector. So thank you. 
Thank you very much. I think also um, your comments about the environment, of course, um, link into some of the thinking that's been prompted for us around, uh, you know, big societal goals, the recommendation in the National Food Strategy. And of course, although that was, you know, for England, um, actually Wales has been doing quite a lot of work in this area already. And uh, in discussions I've been having there and with, with Peter, Nathan and colleagues, thinking about what we can learn from Wales, which might shape the way that we think about this, uh, this more generally. Really. Um, Emily, was there anything more you wanted to add to that? Or I think the, it was that, yeah. I, I wanted to just ask Nathan about the programme for government because I thought it was quite important that we, uh, we said what we were doing, but Ruth asked my question. So <laughs> there we go. Great minds think alike. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you very much uh, for that. And we'll move on now to hear a similar report from, uh, from Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, I was able to meet with Minister Poots, um, actually, uh, just before I officially started, in fact, which was rather good. And I'm looking forward to meeting Minister Swan when I, when I visit next month. Um, I should note also that the board were really pleased to be able to have um, uh, one of these new COVID inventions, a virtual coffee morning, uh, with staff from the Northern Ireland office um, and really to hear at first hand the work that they've been doing, particularly around supporting businesses um, as the procedures evolve as, as part of EU exit. And I, I really want to take the opportunity just to thank the staff in that office because I think they've been doing a, a remarkable job. Um, so I think that um, I'm going to start by inviting uh, Maria Jennings, who has responsibility for, for Northern Ireland, to introduce this paper. And then I'll turn to Colm, who um, chairs the Northern Ireland uh, Food Advisory Committee. Thank you. Maria. Thank you very much, Susan. Good morning, everyone. And I think Susan has stolen a little bit of my thunder. <laughs> Um, I really hope that um, the, the uh, paper outlines um, just how collaboratively the team in Northern Ireland works. We work across um, all the government departments, cabinet office, the executive office, um, Department of Health and Social Care, DEFRA, um, Food Standards Scotland, the Welsh Government. Um, it's really important for us to work in collaboration, but also across the island of Ireland as well. So we work very closely with Safe Food. Um, the All Island Food Safety Promotion Board and also with our colleagues in um, the Food Safety Authority of Ireland as well. Um, so I hope that the paper um, gives a flavour of that. In the past 18 months, of course, the work of the team has been totally dominated by two big priorities. Um, we have been fully embedded in the Northern, Exe Northern Ireland Executive-led response to the pandemic. Um, and also we have been putting in place plans for the end of the transition period and laying the foundations um, for life beyond um, the UK's exit from the European Union. But also I hope the report gives you a flavour of um, the other things that uh, the team in Northern Ireland has been driving forward this year as well. And we've included in that um, a, a forward look of, of our ongoing priorities. Um, I really must say um, that I have to con commend the team for their extensive work and their dedication um, during this period. Um, it, it has honestly been the most challenging period um, that I have ever faced as a civil servant um, and the team have been amazing. Thank you. Cool. Sure, thank you for that. And if, if I can maybe start before I, I talk about the Northern Ireland Advisory Committee, just to endorse Maria's last comments there, I think that the work that the, the FSA team in Northern Ireland have got through, through COVID and EU exit, has been unbelievable. Uh, uh, and I think that the paper, uh, if anything, understates just exactly what they've done, not just for, for, uh, for the agency, but for the, the, for the stakeholders in Northern Ireland. So I think that they, 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 they deserve all of the praise that can be given to them. Uh, from an IFAC point of view, I describe this year as a year of renewal. Uh, we, we four members uh, uh, left the uh, the committee, who three of whom had agreed to stay on for for an extra period because of the complications of COVID. Uh, and I'd like to put on record my thanks to Aidan O'Donnell, Phil O'Neill, Liz Mitchell, and Sarah McCracken for the tremendous work that they did over a period of time. Uh, we renewed them. Uh, we had a competition early in the year uh, and brought four excellent new members: Lynn McMullen, and Ellen Finley, Cahill O'Donnell, and Kieran McCartan to join the existing members: Fiona. Hannah, uh, Lorraine Crawford, Greg Irvin and myself. Uh, so similar to Wales, that brings now a tremendous skill set uh, and network around the table covering uh, agriculture at a producer level, environmental health, 
regulation, uh, education, food poverty, children's services, food business uh, and uh, economic development, particularly with the focus on the agri-food sector. So we're in a very strong place now to, uh, to tap into those uh, um, systems across Northern Ireland. Uh, similar to, to Wales, we look at the, the board papers on a, at a closed meeting, uh, on our, uh, just ahead of all of the board meetings, and we too have themed meetings uh, four or five times a year. Uh, over the course of this year, obviously Brexit has been uh, a particular with regard to the protocol has been a, a major issue that, that has dominated quite a bit. But we've also looked at the food system across Northern Ireland and the future food system. So uh, while uh, Henry Dimbleby has produced the, the, the food strategy for England, uh, we, we've been learning from that. We've got our own uh, foods, uh, food strategy development through through Dara and, and Maria and the team are part of, of, of that. Uh, we've we've looked at the at the food strategy framework at food poverty in some detail, uh, and at food and you and the impacts of Brexit and COVID on the food sector and, and, and with representatives of the food sector coming forward to that. And it was a really useful discussion at our last the meeting in June on food hypersensitivity, where we heard from a, a young person, a young student. Uh, who uh, uh, has a hypersensitivity and, and was an excellent communicator and indeed worked with us in, in uh, work with the agency uh, around the, uh, the campaigns. Uh, our next meeting, as you know, Chair, is on the 20th of October in Belfast, uh, and fingers crossed it will be in person, you know, so we're, we're hoping to do that. The one thing I suppose we miss uh, as a Northern Ireland Food Advisory Committee, and I'm sure Peter would say the same, uh, we used to uh, uh, conduct our meetings, uh, our theme meetings, off-site uh, where possible and go out and meet some of the stakeholders. Mm -hmm. That obviously hasn't been possible. We're not planning to do that in October, but hopefully when we get into the, the programme for 2022, uh, we'll start to get back out and, and meet our stakeholders. So happy we'll take any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I think just as we, in the previous item uh, uh, in relation to our work in Wales, talked about the um, real opportunities to learn from their work they're pressing forward on, on the environment. I think, uh, you know, in, in Northern Ireland, we're obviously doing quite a lot in the in the nutrition and the health space. And I think we can we can learn from that. And again, it's it's another example of, of the value that we have in having this um, sort of uh, you know, connection with with the different the different countries. Um, are there comments from colleagues um, on, on any of the work that's going on in Northern Ireland and particularly some of the challenges that we face there? We've touched on, on the issues of potential divergence throughout this morning's proceedings and we're not going to resolve that right now, um, but uh, it's obviously something that's, that's uppermost in our mind in thinking about Northern Ireland. Ruth? Thank you. Again, uh, a fascinating report and um, just picking up the point about we can learn from uh, what other administrations are doing. I was particularly interested in the work on nutritional standards for health and social care and for procurement. Um, and uh, I wondered, Maria, uh, it talks about guidance, um, and I wondered whether there was any intention to uh, enforce the guidance in any way and turn it into regulatory processes, and whether there was anything to learn from that in, in the thinking that was emerging about how to ensure that the guidance is used. And I guess the step in the middle of that is the monitoring of, of how much the guidance is being is being adopted, even in its voluntary form. And I guess, you know, uh, both schools, uh, hospitals, care settings, really important uh, parts of, of public services where perhaps we could have more impact uh, generally. So I was just interested in, in learning the, the thinking behind uh, the development of the guidance. Thank you very much, Ruth. Um, this is um, work that has been driven very much by the Chief Medical Officer in Northern Ireland. Um, he feels that um, the public sector should get their own house in order before they go out and talk to businesses about how they do this. Um, so we have a long history of um, carrying out this work. Um, we started in schools. Um, and we actually put um, nutrition um, super supervisors into the school inspection service um, and they went round when the, when the school inspectors were carrying out their duties and they looked at all of the nutrition um, and how food was treated in schools and we have a lot of learning from that. So that will be taken forward now into the work that we're doing across the wider public sector. Um, we do have also nutritionists based in one of the health trusts who are there to give advice and support to the, the, the trusts in Northern Ireland um, to, to, to um, comply with the standards. Um, 
there is no talk yet about making that compulsory or uh, or um, putting any legislation around it. Um, we, we do have a high level of compliance in the public sector um, and also it's quite well centralised as well so it's easy to drive forward the, you know, the outcomes that you want. Um, but we will see. It will be interesting. Thank you. Um, that's great. I'm going to close this item. I mean, uh, this um, annual report from the um, uh, from the two countries is is a really helpful opportunity for us to to take stock, um, and also you know an opportunity for me to thank um, Peter and Com for all of their work. You know, I've been delighted to inherit a board um, of very hardworking members, and you don't see a lot of the work that goes on behind the scenes. But of course, Peter and Colm have uh, you know additional responsibilities as well, and uh, I'm very grateful for all their for all their hard work. Thank you. So um, moving on now, the next item on the agenda is the annual governance report, um, and this is something that uh, Ruth Hussey is going to uh, is going to present. Over to you. Thank you, Susan. Um, so it's important that we do review our governance regularly, covering terms of reference and standing orders, uh, as well as our own effectiveness as a board. Um, so as you know, the quorum for the board and business committee was reduced to allow for the fact that we had a gap in appointing uh, new members. And um, now that we have nine board members, the proposal in the paper is we go back to the previous um, uh, quorum and that's uh, re restored to its previous level for both board and business committee. Um, you'll also see that para 312, 313 make two wording changes or propose two wording changes to terms of reference and also that the AREC terms of reference are there for your consideration of being updated. Um, so just in terms of um, board effectiveness, you, you'll note that um, we have uh, each year done an informal um, uh, exercise in getting feedback from board members. Um, but this year, obviously, as I was the interim chair, I couldn't really do that role. Um, so Susan has uh, kindly um, reflected on um, your in induction meetings with the, uh, her board member colleagues. And so we have got uh, feedback, initial feedback from that process. However, uh, I think we felt it was timely that now that we have exited the EU, um, uh, we should now do a formal external uh, effectiveness review. It's probably overdue. Um, and although it's early days, relatively, in terms of the, the new responsibilities we have, the new way we work, um, I think it's important that we do uh, learn from where we've got to, and uh, this is a chance to commission that external review. Uh, so that's a proposal in the paper. Um, and finally, um, just to confirm that Susan will be uh, seeking ministerial agreement for uh, the full complement of board members uh, to be um, uh, expedited. Uh, so just to ask that you agree those proposals in the paper. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. Um, so these are very specific items. So can I first, the, the um, adjustments to the wording um, of increase, in, uh, increasing the number of members to be quorum, are people content with that? Yeah, that's no. Um, and then the uh, sec, the other one, which um, uh, the terms of reference for the for the board. Any any queries, um, and also for the um, for the ARAC committee, the terms of reference. We'll have the ARAC report later. But are people content with with that? Good. Um, so. Any wider comments? I mean, the, the board effectiveness review, I think, is something that is important. I've been talking to the chairs of some other sort of somewhat similar committees, and many of them have had very positive experiences of doing that and have been able to point us towards some potential um, uh, suppliers. Um, so we're in the process of, of commissioning or tendering for that. Um, and I think, it, I think it is, a you know, there's never a perfect moment to do these things, but, but I'm sure there's lots we can, we can learn. So I'm keen to press ahead. Cole. Uh, Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you for the report. Uh, it, it, I agree with everything within it. Uh, and, and I completely agree with the need for the effectiveness review because I don't think we've had an external effectiveness review since, since Ruth and I have been on the board. So I, it is very timely that, that, that we do one. Uh, delighted that we're getting back to the right sort of quorums and so forth and hopefully back to, with the, the Secretary of State's approval, back to the, the full complement of board members. But I would encourage you to, and I know you're working on this, to continue uh, to uh, achieve some level of board continuity 
continuity uh, because I, I think that there is a lot of uh, it, it, it does actually feel I think Ruth you'd probably agree it feels a bit like a new board uh, uh, with a lot of new members have, have come on uh, relatively recently there's a lot of tremendous skills around the board uh, uh, and I think that as we look forward to the end of first terms for some of the members it's getting the continuity and holding on to that experience as, as, as much as possible so I would encourage you to continue those discussions with DHSC to achieve that. Thank you. I have, I've already raised that. I completely agree. I think it's, you know, we have statutory responsibilities in this board, um, some incredibly important um, uh, areas that we're responsible for and, and, and rather complex. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of effort goes into induction and learning about these things. I'm quite keen we get our, uh, I guess, return on investment if I'm thinking about this in very uh, hard-nosed ways. Um, so, uh, and I think also during the pandemic, um, you know, it, with the best will in the world, it's been harder for members to bring some of the added value that they might otherwise have done. Um, yeah, so those, those discussions are underway and I'll obviously update the board in due course, but um, we certainly need to appoint some new members. Any further comments on uh, anything in Ruth's, uh, Ruth's report? Okay, without further ado then, I shall move on to the next, um, the next item, and that is uh, the annual report to the board from the um, uh, ARAC committee, the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee, uh, which is another one of COM's many hats, um, and, uh, and this is indeed a, a really, well, a, a, as is the Irish responsibility, but this is another important role uh, for, for the FSA. Over to you. Chair, thank you. And members will have had an opportunity to read the annual report for uh, the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee for the year ended 31st of March 21. Uh, very busy year for IRAC, just given all that had happened with uh, EU exit and uh, COVID. Uh, all meetings were held virtually. The last in-person IRAC meeting was actually at the beginning of March 2020, just before the pandemic hit. Uh, so we've held all of our meetings virtually over MS Teams. Uh, uh, the say people have read the report, but just to highlight a few areas, I'd like to um, give my thanks for the tremendous support we received from the executive. I'm particularly grateful for the very attentive support from the accounting officer and chief executive, uh, Emily. Uh, that doesn't always happen in my experience, so to actually have that level of support from the accounting officer is really valuable. Uh, thanks also to Chris Hitch and our FD, who's no longer with us, has moved on to um, well back to his future, if you like, in the banking industry, uh, and, uh, um, and and to his team who have been absolutely tremendous around all of the accounts, etc. Uh, and to John Fairley, the Head of Audit Assurance, and his team for all of the tremendous support. Uh, and also with regard to the accounts, we well supported by Mazars and the Northern Ireland, or the National Audit Office uh, for the support around the accounts. Uh, can I put on record thanks to all of the current and former uh, IRAC members, to Mary uh, Quick, who left us in, in, in August uh, at the end of her first term, to Ruth, who left us briefly, uh, at the end of January uh, when she became uh, interim chair of the board and thankfully returned again to Tim and Peter uh, and to Margaret who joined us just after the, the year end. Uh, so we're, thankfully we, we, we're back to a full complement of five members. Uh, it, it was touch and go for a time over the course of the year because we, we agreed, uh, as you discussed in Ruth's paper, uh, that we wouldn't change the quorum of three. Uh, at for, for quite a bit of time, there only were three of us on the committee, so that nobody was allowed to miss a meeting, uh, and, and guys will remember that. Uh, the, the accounts were delayed again uh, in, in uh, 2020, uh, in 2020, 2021, uh, the, uh, they were lodged, uh, the 2020 accounts were, were lodged uh, in December, uh, still within guidelines, Treasury guidelines. Uh, this was due to uh, external audit requirements in relation to the local government pension scheme in which we have a small interest. Uh, but I think it's important to, to note that all of the work uh, that the FSA had to do was done by the June audit meeting uh, and the accounts for Wales and Northern Ireland uh, were, were laid in time. Uh, and over the course of the year, we, we continued to look at the very important uh, risk areas around the corporate risk register, cyber security and audit assurance. And, and despite all of the challenges brought about by EU exit and COVID, uh, I think the team stepped up to the plate and actually delivered very, very well. Uh, in addition to the audit report, uh, I've also included brief notes of the IRAC meetings on the 6th of September and the, the special IRAC meeting on the 11th of August, uh, where we looked in some detail 
detail at the FSA approach to commercial contract letting and management. Uh, ARAC provided robust scrutiny uh, and challenge to the executive, which will be very helpful, I believe, to them uh, in, in, in moving forward into the OTP discussion that, uh, that Colin took us through earlier. Uh, and uh, these discussions are ongoing, and we'll discuss again at the next ARAC meeting in uh, November. So happy to take any questions. Great, thank you. Um, I appreciate it's been a busy year and um, I think the work you did, as you mentioned at that extraordinary meeting, uh, was, was incredibly important, very timely and, um, yeah, uh, as you say, uh, further to do in relation to our, our due diligence activities. Any comments, Margaret? Um, as a new member, I mean, I'm really impressed by... Um, the work that ARAC does. Um, I, I noticed that you mentioned in the August the 11th meeting um, that uh, we do, as we always do, uh, provided scrutiny um, uh, to the executive and support as well. Um, and I think it's important sometimes to minute that. And also the fact that the executive provided explanations and assurances to us. Thank you. Just looking at Tim and Ruth as other members of ARAC, whether there was anything more you wanted to add to that report, Tim? Well, not really. Um, you know, sometimes you underestimate silence gives to a conversation, but um, I, I just to endorse everything that's just been said, I, I, having been on the other side of an audit committee as a chief executive officer in the past, um, I know the value that it contributes, and I have to commend the executive in their very positive response to how they use ARAC's insights. So nothing but praise. Uh, there's some difficult issues, certainly, to address, but I think they'd be there with candidly and with a forward look. So I think, uh, you know, congratulations to everybody on that. Um, I, I mean, this is, you know, even though there ha we haven't had a lot of discussion, I think that is because we've got an incredibly good, very committed uh, committee, well-led. Uh, we've got a great executive team working well together. And, uh, you know, it's important as the board, we maintain the scrutiny of this because, uh, you know, past performance is not always a good predictor of, of future. Um, uh, but uh, thank you for all, all the work that's been done so far. Ruth's going to come in with just... Well, just, just on that um, uh, scrutiny... Uh, angle and just say thank you to Colm for his excellent chairmanship of the committee. It's a real pleasure to work with him. Um, but I just wanted to pick up um, the way we've done uh, recent work on deep dives, I think is a, an interesting model for us to, to expand and develop further and just reflect on how we do that. Um, I think they have value in other parts of the business of the organisation. So I'm hoping ARAC will uh, sort of um, develop a sort of a, a robust approach to how we do this learning on uh, based on what we've done so far um, and identify other areas where we could do something similar that's a value Thank to the business and to support uh, Emily as, as the accounting officer. Thank you. That's a really interesting point. And I guess the question is how how we do identify those topics, how we prioritise them and so on. Um, Emily. Thank you. Um, I just thought I should say thanks for the thanks, um, if nothing else. Um, Mutual uh, admiration society. Yeah. Um, and, and to just do a bit of a forward look, so you've done a, a, a retrospective look column in your report for which, for which thanks. Um, I think uh, over the next year or so, um, the, the priority issues that we need to reflect on, well, first of all, how we're using local authority audit um, in the context of uh, the um, limited resources that have been put into food inspection, so how we um, focus that better. Um, secondly, uh, I, I think we do an annual discussion about risk, don't we, in January, which we then uh, bring to the board formally in March. I think this year's discussion on risk um, will feel quite different to previous ones because we've had so much change in the last year. Um, so, for example, on animal feed, do we need to feature that? Where are we on food fraud? Where we, are we on um, divergence? Um, and then the third area is that, um, as Colin mentioned earlier, we're gearing up to um, thinking about our service delivery partner. The contract for that um, runs out in 2023. So next year will be a year where we'll be wanting ARAC's input into our thinking on the future options that we have there. Um, and uh, we are very appreciative of the scrutiny we get. It, it feels, it can feel sharp at times. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the conversation we had in August I know that the team felt they were very much put through their paces, um, but I think that's appropriate, so, so thank you. 
if I can just go back on Ruth's point, we, we, we did have a discussion just at the end of Heather's tenure uh, around looking at deep dives, and we have agreed a programme of that, and we keep that under review uh, very much in line with the, the accounting officer and the executive about what, is the, the, what are the big issues. But at the last Iraq meeting in September, I think we were delighted to see a change in uh, colour, let's say, of the risk report, uh, which which is more reflective of the risks as we believe they, they, they said. So I think it, 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 Emily's absolutely right. It'll be a really interesting discussion come January time around the risk profile. Good, and we must um, make sure we leave adequate time for that discussion because it, it is, a, you know, it is a, a bit of a change. Thank you very much. Um, so that's, uh, I think that concludes that agenda item. And now, slightly curiously, we're, um, we're back to uh, Wales and Northern Ireland to receive reports from the chairs of the advisory committees. This, of course, is a sort of standing item that comes up on our agenda because it coincides this time with the annual report. Um, I'm imagining there probably isn't a, a great deal more to say. Um, um, just the yeah, agreement from Peter and Colm about that. But it is an opportunity. Oh, Peter's going to come in. It is an opportunity for other board members if there are any wider comments uh, that you wanted to make about uh, the work of those committees, then, then uh, now's the moment. But Peter, to you first. We're looking forward to saying Kroisoe Gamri to you, Chair, next week uh, in your visit to Wales and very much welcome the fact that you are coming to talk to stakeholders there on the ground and to see issues for yourself so that the depth of understanding is there right at the top in this organisation. Thank you, Peter. This... I always enjoy my trips to Wales and that's not only because it's quicker than getting to London. <laughs> ah. <laughs> the second thing is that uh, our October meeting of the committee is going to be in person, so that will be uh, a, a very welcome change. And the third thing is uh, that we will be saying the same words of Kroisoe Gumri to the whole board in December. And we are greatly looking forward to that occasion. And uh, so far as the committee is concerned, the advisory committee, we hope that there will be an opportunity for perhaps informal contact with the members of the committee themselves. Thank you. Very much so. Um, uh, you know, planning is always subject at the moment to, to external circumstances, but very much um, uh, hoping to come down to Wales really to meet with people. You know, we, we can in a way do this meeting um, anywhere, but uh, the opportunity actually to meet with people uh, locally is, is really important. So we're definitely trying to build that in. Sure, I, I not not a whole lot to add to what I've already said. Uh, other than similarly, we have our next meeting uh, in in October, as I've already said, hope, uh, hoping to hold that in person. Uh, I'm looking forward to welcoming you, uh, and, and hopefully you'll get the opportunity to meet with Minister Swan uh, and uh, and some of the other stakeholders. Uh, so very much looking forward to that. Uh, oh, so and, by, and by the way, you'll you'll actually get to Belfast even quicker than you'll get the car. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, so perhaps actually I could I could say to the board whether there are any issues that you would like me to pick up when I'm making some of these visits. Um, yeah, any uh, I, I'd welcome those. I you know either now or or separately. All content. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll move. Uh, that really takes us. Actually, we. Um, brilliantly caught up on time so that brings us to any other business um, at the start of the meeting uh, I wasn't aware that there were any points uh, to discuss but I know things sometimes pop up during the course of it and so we do have a few moments if there's anything that any members of the board want to raise I'm also very conscious that we have rattled through particularly the first few items on the agenda, which were extremely substantive. Um, and I suppose I'm just going to give a, a couple of moments uh, to Emily or to any of your directors if there were points that you felt just didn't get, didn't get finished off or if there's any additional uh, things that you want to make just casting around the room. Tim. Thank you. I wouldn't normally raise any other business, but I, just as the opportunities come up, um, in other discussions, I think we've uh, noticed quite recently the issues around animal feeds 
um, are something that perhaps deserve board attention. Um, and as a former member of the Advisory Committee on Animal Feeds, um, it may be timely for us to devote some attention to it. Um, I know there have been issues around continuity of expertise. Um, clearly there's me as a board member that can find some of that, but uh, I have mentioned also that there might be value in getting expertise from some of the original members of that committee, particularly Ian Brown who chaired it. Um, I think that still could be useful uh, and in, in a purely advisory capacity, um, but I'd look forward to us having future discussions around this because I think also in the, the risk profile and our, our risk appetite, we ought to sort of accommodate these issues because it's very easy to uh, relegate them into the background when other things have been taking our attention. Um, absolutely, that's a very valid point, and uh, as you just heard a moment ago, Emily mentioned that as an area we, we need to think about in detail, and, and that reflects conversations that, that Emily and I have, have had. So I think we're all on the same, they're all on the same page there, but thank you for, for raising it. Emily. Uh, so, given you've given us the opportunity. <laughs> Um, one of the things I was half expecting the board to ask about today was about price inflation for food. Um, it's been in the news this morning. Um, we know that uh, there are forecasts of, um, uh, we know that a number of um, trade bodies are concerned about that question as well. And I just wanted to say um, on, on the question of food affordability, uh, what the FSA is, is doing in relation to that. So um, we do play, pay close attention to anything that's uh, got an impact on the availability or affordability of food. Um, we, uh, during COVID, we extended our research through the COVID tracker, um, which has given us some insights into the social and economic changes that affect consumer behaviour. And as mentioned earlier, um, our new annual report would be a place where we could focus on consumer concerns. So I just wanted to, to say all that into the record, really. Um, and then the only other thing to, I, I thought I should mention on the question of divergence, which is featured in a couple of conversations today, is obviously something we at, on the executive have been wrestling with and we're thinking through um, a set of principles that we'd like to bring back to the board that would help guide um, the, uh, the executive and how to approach this question. Um, you had previously given us uh, some steers and we think we can refine those a bit now we've been operating the system a little bit more. David? Yes, um, following on what Emily said on affordability of food, I, I need to say this very carefully, and, and I think we should be careful on this. Affordability of food depends on two things, the cost of the food and the wages of the people who are buying the food. Now, of course, those and benefits are a, a different category. And I think it's too early to say, but we're seeing interesting things at the moment in the rapid increase in wages uh, brought about by the shortage of, uh, of cheap labour from Europe. Uh, personally, something I welcome to see that wages at the bottom end of the scale rising much more rapidly than the way they should have done for years. And of course, food prices also, there's inflation. So I think we need to keep a watching brief on this at both levels before coming to any determination on whether food is affordable or not. Um, if food rises in price, that's okay, so long as wages and benefits are rising faster, in my opinion. Thank you. Oh, Ruth, one final one. It's just... <laughs> Reflecting back to the uh, food and use survey that we do, uh, and I know uh, when I was on the Welsh Food Advisory Committee, we had a special report on uh, food poverty, and what really struck us was uh, the proportion of young people who were affected by affordability of food. So I think there's a, there's a, a population interest which is differential, if you like. So uh, whilst uh, I think we should keep an eye on it, we should also be looking at particular groups of people in the population to make sure that there, there aren't particular pockets of real concern. I was really struck in the report we saw that um, people actually commented they ran out of money for food. And, and that's an extraordinary situation. So uh, I think it's probably a key area for us to sure. think about. And of course that makes, um, you know, adds food safety risks. People are more likely to be, uh, you know, buying food which is near the end of its sell-by date and perhaps reduced and keeping it for longer and, and so forth.
Okay, thank you to members, thank you to the executive team for all of those contributions. I don't promise to always give you that little free-for-all um, at the end, but um, anyway, I think it, I think it surfaced uh, a couple of very important uh, important issues. Um, I don't know if Heather Hancock, the, the former uh, chair, uh, might, might look into this, but um, uh, I don't know whether she will approve of us uh, <laughs> uh, going off piste, but um, I hope that uh, she will feel the, the uh, board and the FSA remain in safe hands. And um, I, you know, really have come to recognise just what good shape um, Heather has left uh, the board in and indeed all the work with the agency, particularly in relation to putting in place the systems to allow us to manage the exit from the EU. And I'm, you know, hugely grateful to her for that. Um, so if you are listening, Heather, thank you very much indeed for all your work. But uh, we come to the end of the board meeting, but our work is, is not over because this afternoon, or at least after lunch, we're going to have the business committee meeting, um, and that will start um, at 12.30. Uh, but for this morning, uh, thank you for all your contributions, and I'll close the meeting. Thank you. So welcome back to everyone uh, after lunch and welcome to people who are joining us online. Um, we're moving into the uh, business committee uh, uh, proceedings and again all the papers are on our website. Um, I'm going to start by um, handing over to Emily to introduce her, her report. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. So you've had my report. Um, again, it was published on Monday. Um, I won't reprise it in my opening comments um, to, to give the highlights. So um, I, uh, the business committee looks at the internal operational function of the FSA. So we've, I've talked about um, our staffing for official controls. We've had a heavy quarter um, with Kobani and August leave. Um, I, I addressed the question about vet um, supply and with our service delivery partner. It still feels a bit precarious and the situation is a bit fluid. Colin um, Sullivan, our operations director and team, have been working extremely hard on it. Um, I also mentioned uh, local authority recovery. Um, we set out our plan in May. We are seeing some encouraging early signs. Local authorities have still got a long way to go to get back into doing their food hygiene inspections at the level that we would expect um, in a normal world. Um, but the, the um, the data that we saw 12,000 food hygiene ratings awarded in June, which compares to 470 the same June, in June the year before, and actually about 16,000 in June the year before that. So you can see we're sort of back, getting back up to the levels we would expect. There's still quite a backlog. Um, just on the current financial picture, uh, I mentioned um, the underspend that we had at the beginning of the year, the fact that that's looking a little healthier now. Um, it's a moving picture, as you can imagine, our forecasts uh, change regularly. Um, so the, the number that I gave you in my report, which is that it's, it's down to about a million, that will shift a little, um, but we, we feel like we're getting on top of that. And the spending review bid um, that we have submitted went in on Monday to the Treasury, so we can't obviously comment in detail on that now, but we're um, hopeful that that will uh, have an impact. Um, uh, the other thing to mention is COVID. Um, we have been uh, working to try and uh, um, bring the offices back to a bigger capacity. We were, at t we were allowed to have 10% occupancy um, for most of the COVID period. Most of our offices now are back up to about 40 or 50% and we'll keep that under very close review depending on um, the risk assessments done by our landlords. Um, and as ever, staff have been very flexible and um, I'm very grateful to them. But that's as much as I'll say now and uh, open to questions. Thank you. Um, I should say we, we will carry on and take comments on Emily's report. Um, I'm getting completely ahead of myself. I think because we were following on from the board meeting this morning, I forgot all the introductions and minutes and actions. But let's comment on Emily's report and then we'll scoop back up to the top. Um, apologies for that. So, um, Emily, I think that was a really helpful summary and, and really shows how busy things have, have continued, um, continued to be. I noted in particular the work of the National Food Crime Unit um, and members will be aware that I've written to ministers uh, with regard to seeking those additional uh, PACE powers. 
Um, and I guess I'd remind members that we'll have the annual report from the National Food Crime Unit um, at the December board meeting. So that's perhaps not something to, to dwell on today, but uh, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to look at that. Um, anything uh, others wanted to raise or ask further questions about? Mark. Thank you, Susan. Um, just a couple, uh, again, of reflections, if I may. There's a, uh, a comment, Emily, about local authorities reporting various levels of resource being diverted to COVID-19. Um, I'm quite interested to know a little bit more about that because most of the COVID-19 legislation that they were enforcing has now expired. Um, now, it may be that they were reporting and they won't go f going forwards, but I'm just interested to know uh, what kind of diversion that might look like. Um, there's a specific example in here in terms of Northern Ireland and local authorities being uh, diverted to Port Healthwork, and yet Northern Ireland is showing as being uh, the, the greatest recovery towards the food hygiene. So, you know, clearly it can be done, uh, even, even with some of those pressures. So, yeah, just interested to know a little bit more about what we're being told about that diversion and whether, and whether it's something that we're happy to accept or whether we ought to uh, challenge. Um, and my other quick uh, reflection is around the National Food Crime Unit. Always fascinating to hear about the investigations they're engaged with, but wouldn't want to lose sight of all of the other work they do around prevention, which in my view is at least, if not more important, uh, to protecting consumers. Thank you. Um, I totally agree with you on prevention. And I think if you were to um, mark the NFCU's homework just on prosecutions, then you would not be appreciating the, the significant work they do in um, other ways of disrupting food fraud. Um, I'm going to ask Maria to comment on the detail uh, that we've been hearing from local authorities because it's the regulatory compliance division that is in the um, liaison groups with local authorities, particularly around England, but also talking to Wales and Northern Ireland. Maria. Thanks, Emily and Mark. Thank you for raising this. Um, we aren't, aren't um, seeing very positive signs of staff returning back to their, um, to, to their um, you know, core duties yet. So it's around some of them are helping out with track and trace uh, still and, and also um, wider COVID compliance. So we're carrying out an, a temperature check um, across all the local authorities in October. Um, and that will give us a really full picture of what is actually happening on the ground. Um, where we have, uh, we talked in the report about the small number of authorities that um, felt that they weren't meeting our, um, our minimum expectations, but when we explored in more detail with them, um, they actually were. So we don't have any local authorities at the minute that we're concerned about in terms of getting onto that recovery roadmap. Um, in Northern Ireland, we're a bit more fortunate because um, those staff are dedicated within food teams and haven't, in general, been drawn away um, to, to do other duties. Um, we also have some new um, officers coming through the university system who were used to back backfill to allow more experienced officers to do some of the port health work. Um, so we, we were quite lucky in terms of our workforce there. Bruce. Uh, just continuing on the local authority um, uh, recovery plan, um, I guess it's important for us to anticipate um, uh, what the implications of the COVID-19 winter plan that was published yesterday. Um, you know, whilst it's encouraging that we're getting back to the sorts of levels of inspections we would expect, we still have a backlog. Um, so my anxiety would be over the winter that if we if the um, restrictions in England go to a, a higher level whether or not we would continue to expect the same pace of recovery or what the implications might be um, and whether that backlog would extend even further. So uh, I guess it's too early as it was only published yesterday, but it'd be really helpful to make an assessment of the likely impact if, um, hopefully not, but if the government was to go to plan B or whatever it was, just uh, extra uh, precautions, what that would mean for our backlog. Because I, I think, you know, we really do need to see continued pace on this now. Um, uh, absolutely agree, Ruth. Um, so one of the encouraging signs, I, I feel like we're in the sort of, on the, on, on the one hand, we're worried, and on the other hand, there are encouraging signs, and, and that's what, how I feel we are at the moment. Uh, and in, and it, one of the encouraging signs is that um, we have given £900,000 to local authorities to triage the backlog. And um, in some cases, we're hearing that up to 25% of, um, of the food businesses that are sitting in their, in their list to go and visit 
are actually not trading, that they were moments of time. It was a moment of time. Um, someone may have thought they were going to set up a new food business and during lockdown they were on furlough. They're now back in work. So um, we don't know how whether that 25% is true across the board or whether it's just um, a one-off statistic, but it may mean that as many as a quarter of the um, food businesses on the list don't actually need visiting. Um, the other thing that we can see from our data is that um, around a third of the businesses in that list are very low risk businesses. So um, they're, they're called other catering premises. There's probably um, home baking going on. It's relatively shelf stable products and so on. So, so th those are encouraging signs. On the other hand, um, we, we it, it's, it, there has been a depletion that's happened over the last year. I think you said, the board said in, um, in December last year, we can tolerate some delay for a bit but not for long. And the longer that the delays happen, the more extended this situation becomes, um, the more we have slowly degraded a capability that is essential to food safety in this country. And that capability is the inspection and visits and the support that local authorities give to food businesses. Now, I, I, we could cope with a, a short-term um, interruption to that, but my concern is that if that lasts over a year or two years or um, longer, that is, a, that is a degradation that would be detrimental to the basic controls that we have in place. Thank you. If I can, if I can come back, Chair. Uh, absolutely, uh, that's the concern. We already had concerns about the, the, the level of skills and, and capacity uh, in, in the workforce, uh, in, in local authorities. And if people are continuing to be seconded to test and trace and these other functions, um, you know, it's a real risk that we will turn around and realise that we just haven't got the, the breadth of skill that we need going forward. So um, I think this is quite a critical moment over the winter that we do expect as, as an agency that we do start to recover the position that we were in before. Oh, that we're in. Which, which prompts me to say a further thing, which is about the workforce. So um, it's not just about the individuals who are currently in local authorities being diverted. We know that um, about half of local authorities have been carrying vacancies in their food team, sometimes for more than six months. So there is a systemic issue of local authorities not having been able to fund apprenticeships, training posts and so on over the, over the recent period, which means we haven't got the pipeline of new arrivals into the environmental health profession or trading standards in the way that we do in Northern Ireland because of, of what, um, as, as Maria was describing. So that it's not just the short term issue, there is a systemic question about the workforce that's, that's ne that needs to be addressed. Um, Susan uh, has written to, um, uh, to support uh, the Ministry of Housing, Communities and Local Governments bid on local authority funding um, and we've been very closely involved with MHCLG's work um, coordinating the regulatory services question post-pandemic. Those are good things but um, I wouldn't want the government to be under any illusion that that's going to be enough. There, there will need to be funding and there will need to be some, I think, some workforce planning in this space. Thank you. I think it's incredibly important that, you know, we, we haven't seen a significant spike in food incidents despite this. Lower, but that is because it's, you know, a, a lot of the businesses have been closed and it's really important that people don't, you know, put those two together and come to an erroneous conclusion. And um, I think I totally agree. This is a, a high priority area for us because it is, it's a significant area of, of risk. You know, we've got risk on the issue of the border controls we were hearing about earlier. We've got added risk there and we've now got added risk at the, at the other end of the chain. And, you know, for us as a board, I think we absolutely have to recognise that you know, the risks have increased right across the whole food system. I saw somebody trying to come in. Uh, I'm going to let Mark come back to sort of finish up this point and then Colm and Margaret. Thank you, Chair. Just a very quick point on something you just said then, Emily, about apprenticeships. Uh, my understanding is that currently environmental health and trading standards qualifications aren't mapped to apprenticeship standards, which means local authorities can't use their levy to fund that training. Um, I wonder if there might be something we could do to support the professional organisations in doing that. Maria is our expert on competency, or she's looking at me like a, she's not. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, we, we, so, we, we, as you know, we, we did some work on the competencies um, for environmental health professionals earlier this year because what the FSA sets out in its Food Law Code of Practice, what, what capability requirements we set out there, 
has a consequence for the freedoms local authorities have in terms of recruiting staff. So we have done some revision, but we are um, keeping a close eye on it. Maria, do you want to comment on apprenticeships? Please, yes. Um, Mark, that is not my understanding. Um, my understanding is that, that a number of environmental health teams have taken on um, apprenticeships and um, sh they are working quite well, although um, sometimes people poach the, the apprentices as they come through the system. I'm not an expert in environmental health. I know it doesn't work in, in trading standards. standards to the end of that. I also uh, believe that the apprenticeship that's on offer at the moment is sort of entry level, doesn't take you to the full qualified and competent officer level. Uh, so I just wonder whether we might. OK, can I suggest we just take this sort of out of the committee and, and bottom it out because uh, we're not going to resolve it, uh, resolve it today. I mean, we're all keen that we should see a better pipeline and support uh, from, from the bottom. Susan, thank you. Uh, Emily, thank you for the report. Yeah, I've just a couple of questions. I'm happy to take them either now or in the performance report. They are, as you would imagine, around, around finance. Uh, you did reference the fact that, although the report says 7.5 million, that Westminster is down to a million. I'm assuming that means the Northern Ireland and Wales figures aren't changed, so we're still potentially looking at a 3 million underspend. So, so interested to know, given the change in risk appetite uh, in this particular area from the board, what we're going to do to make sure that we're, we're we don't have a three million uh, spend. I'd also be, be interested just in the view, uh, and again, not one to be answered now, as to how we can get more up-to-date financial information in the reports rather than I think those figures are to the end of June, so you know how we could actually get slightly more. The more pertinent question for me is around the spending review, uh, uh, and, and I am conscious that things will be tight given where, where Treasury are at the present time. However, we are looking at a three-year settlement here. Uh, in the middle of that three-year settlement, maybe maybe a food bill, maybe the outworkings of, of, of that, and maybe further work for that. How, how do we not undersell ourselves uh, so that uh, some of the stuff we want to do, we can't afford to do? Um, Colm, I've been asking exactly exactly that, on the, on the latter point, exactly that question. Um, we understand from Treasury that we should not be considering putting in uh, bids which relate specifically to things that are coming out of the National Food Strategy. But what we have done, written into it very explicitly, is areas in which we think the FSA could contribute, and we've given an indication of the likely resources for that. So uh, I think that that's the best halfway house we can achieve um, uh, at this point. Emily, do you want to comment on those earlier points? Um, I think, I actually, I might ask Maria to comment on the Northern Irish underspend, which is the substantial one. Um, the Wales one, I think we're treating uh, in the same way that Westminster. So we, we're, we're looking at pipeline, but actually the Northern Ireland one is quite specific because it relates to EU um, activity that we're expecting to happen that didn't happen. Um, Maria. Thanks, Emily. Um, yes, Colm, thanks for asking the question. Um, we, this um, relates to specific money that is funnelled through the FSA to district councils in Northern Ireland to carry out their new duties at points of entry. Um, and we have had, um, we, we, um, we allocate that money on the basis of work actually completed um, by the councils. And we have had a reduced requirement request from those councils specifically um, in the last few weeks Belfast City Council and um, so we will be do um, we will be surrendering some money actually back into the system uh, in the October monitoring round. Um, I see that Julie's got her hand up online I wonder if you want to it was it specifically on this point Julie? It was it was regarding the um, Wales budget forecast so if I can just pick up on that that um, yes um, in Wales, we are also forecasting an underspend. We are behind our spend profile, um, but we're actively looking at how we can accelerate our um, expenditure plans. Um, and we are in close discussion with Welsh Government, so they're fully aware of the situation. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on, uh, Margaret, I think you wanted to raise another point. Yes, mine's about internal staffing, so moving on a bit. Um, are there plans for a return to work? Uh, will there be a change of policy in how um, the FSA regards um, the way staff internally work? And are there positives or negatives emerging by the lack of interaction we've had by people not coming into the office so much in the last 18 months? People have been working really hard. They've just not been working in their office. <laughs> Great. Um, yeah, so uh, we are seeing some um, 
uh, in-person activity starting to happen again. So Stephen Pollock ran a communications away day last week, where, which 20 people attended in person, um, which by all accounts was, um, was just fantastic. People were delighted to see each other again. Um, and I know that other teams are planning similar. Um, what we're, uh, and so just in, in very specific terms, um, we are uh, putting all of our buildings through um, the, the, or our locations through the landlord's risk assessments. We think it's, as I said, that it should be up to about 40% to 50% occupancy by the end of this month. That will then, be, we hope, get reviewed again, depending on COVID prevalency and so on. Um, uh, as we encourage people to come back into the office, um, what I'm expecting is that we will have to learn how to do blended meetings more. So some people online, some people in the office. That's a new way of working for us. We've, we did it a bit before, um, but possibly with more people in, in the room than online. So we've got we've got that to, um, to traverse, as it were. Um, and then we've also, as you know, we have a, a very, a quite a flexible arrangement with staff where up to twice a year they can choose to change their contract. Um, and we just did a, a, um, a, an exercise with all staff to ask if they wanted to change their contract. Um, we've had quite a number move off an office-based contract to a contract where there would be half and half, so half at home, half in the office. Um, and then a number who've moved to a more home working arrangement where they would uh, expect to be um, one day a week in the office and the rest of the time at home. Um, so we're expecting our office footprint to be used much more for collective meetings and less for people sitting at a desk and I think there's a lot of staff saying they want to try and see what it's like once people are back in the office we expect or certainly the experience at the moment when you go into the office is there's not a lot of circulation happening because everyone is two meters apart and you don't have people next to you so it's a bit like sitting at home and people are saying well what's the point if I can't chat to people so I think it will be the um, the team meetings a bit like what Stephen and the communications team did last week that will be how we use the office space we're therefore looking at how we can um, do more um, uh, meeting room space in the offices that we do have. David, I think you wanted to come in on this point. Yes. <clears throat> well, respecting or advocating the, 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 the possibility for staff to choose their sort of own working conditions as far as possible, I hope you as senior management will still retain the right to be able to say to stamp staff, I'm sorry, but your role requires you to be in the office X days a week or in these days per week. We, we do absolutely have that. So, for example, with our field operations staff, we have um, uh, set places they have to go to work. Um, and there are some other roles where, which do require um, physical presence like that that we would set. Um, there was another point that was on my mind. I'll come back to it when I remember it. Um, Emily, could I just ask, I mean, we have the option of being entirely home-based or a bit of both, but are, are people able to choose to be in the office full-time? Because for some people that is going to be important for yes. other reasons. Yeah, so we... So, um, we encourage people to choose one of the half and half or home working um, options just because that would put less pressure on, on our estate and from a financial point of view, we're keen to, um, to have less of a footprint. But where there's a welfare issue or where, um, we, where, for example, if you've got a young person who's starting um, at work and just you know, doesn't have the need to be at home and does want to be building those relationships, getting that mentoring from, um, from people nearby, we would expect that they would want to have an office-based contract. Oh, I know what my point was. Um, one of the things, the advantages of the system that we've got, we, we, we obviously advertise ourselves as a flexible working organisation, and we have been starting to win awards for, um, uh, for that and our parent-friendly approach. The thing I'm very struck by is how when I meet staff, and I meet all new starters every month, I do a coffee morning, is where they come from in a geographically dispersed way. So we've got people working for us who live in Cornwall, who live in Pembrokeshire, who live in Cumbria. Um, who, uh, for, who live in the far reaches of, um, of Northern Ireland, who would not be able to work for a government department at this level um, if, it was, uh, if they had to come into an office in the same way. And a lot of people um, who live in the north of England, for instance, feel that they won't have opportunities at senior level um, if, unless they move to London. So I do think from a levelling up point of view, there is an advantage to the way we're working. Thank you. And uh, we've had discussions about this previously. And I think the important thing is that, you know, we are learning as we go along and that there's, you know, very clear evaluation of this and, and that feedbacks both from staff and from the business. You know, are we, is it delivering against our, our business objectives in the way we hope? And so, you know, that may be something that the board will want to come back to um, in a, you know, few months, six, 12 months time. Uh, 
Julie's got her hand up uh, again. So, Julie. Thank you. Just very briefly, um, it's also worth remembering that even for those who are office-based, they are often based in different offices, whether that be Belfast, Cardiff or London, um, and they need to work together across that geographical physical divide. So we need to also think about how, how we do that. Um, we are learning as we go. We are having to create new protocols of how, how we work, how we manage meetings how we interact with each other so there is that human dimension to it and also in parallel my team are looking at new uh, technology innovations as just how we can um, work better with meetings um, have have those flip charts have those whiteboards and um, uh, reproduce much of that sort of working so i think we're actively um, moving forward on all of those fronts thanks Thank you. And um, I do think, uh, as you said, Emily, we've been doing this sort of um, somewhat more flexible working longer than, than many. I mean, this, this predates the pandemic. Um, and I think what we should also be thinking about is capturing some of even our learning so far, because I think that's quite relevant for other, uh, other organisations. Certainly when I met with the chairs of some of the other um, you know, safety regulators, they were sort of grappling with issues which uh, we've been there, seen it, done it on, on that one. So um, I think we should we should share that. Maria? Susan, just on that, that's a great point. Um, we have been asked by a number of organisations to come and talk to them about our experience. So we have already been doing that and sharing that with that learning. Great, thank you. OK, important to have that discussion because it's a, a very topical issue. Um, any other points from Emily's report? OK. Uh, in which case I'm going to remind myself to back up to the top of the agenda. I'm so sorry about that. Um, and uh, so, yes, wind back. <laughs> and um, I should say that uh, welcome to everybody who's here. We have only have apologies um, in terms of board members from, from Fiona Gately, who's unwell and unable to be here. Um, and we have um, most members of the executive team with us in person. But uh, we have Julie Pierce and Rick Mumford who are joining us um, online. Um, can I, uh, we, I asked this earlier today, but just for the record, can I just ask if any members of the board have any uh, declarations of interest which are new? We haven't squeezed anything in over lunchtime. Good. Um, and uh, whether any members have any items of other, any other business that they want to add to the agenda? No. OK, so we're then to the minutes of the last meeting, uh, which is on the 16th of June. And uh, is everybody happy that those are an accurate record of the proceedings? Lots of nods around the table. Um, there were just two actions arising from that, both of which have been completed. Um, unless people have specific questions, um, I suggest we move on. Okay, so we'll now hop over the chair's report. It's a shame we can't edit the recording for people who uh, are watching later so that they don't realise my slip up. Um, but anyway, we're now, uh, just to orientate everybody, we're going to start looking at the, uh, some of the operational papers, um, beginning with the uh, performance and resources report for the first quarter of this year. Um, I'm really pleased, um, well, to say uh, a, a welcome again to uh, Pam Biedman, who's our new Director of Finance and Performance. Um, Pam, I think, is going to present the report today, but um, as, as you're aware, Pam is very, very new to the team, um, and so uh, Craig Thomas has been doing a lot of work on this, who's our Head of Finance and Performance, and Craig's with us as well, so I think this will probably be a little bit of a double act. Thank you. Over Chair. to you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, so yes, I would like to say thank you for the warm welcome. Um, I haven't been here long, but it's been uh, lovely so far. And I'd also like to thank the team who have prepared this report for us um, in readiness for my arrival. Um, so thanks for that. Um, now a lot of the things that I was going to point out, uh, I will take the report as being read, uh, you've actually drawn out of uh, the Chief Executive's report. Um, uh, so I'll probably just focus uh, a little bit on the numbers actually, just to give you a little bit more information. Um, Wales, uh, so I've got the updated forecast, um, it does move on uh, from this report, this is as at the end of June, uh, reflecting on the comments on this 
uh, I'm sure that we can look to uh, provide some more up-to-date information going forward. Um, the August numbers have actually, but they're literally just happening now. Uh, they were slightly delayed because the finance team have been working on the spending review. Uh, but certainly we would have another month's numbers to inform the board. Uh, so we'll look to provide that in future. Um, at July, the underspend for Westminster had gone down to about 2 million, which was um, quite comforting. And it has gone down a little bit more since then. However, um, I don't think we can be complacent um, because um, COVID is still impacting delivery. Uh, we've just heard there's the COVID, well, we don't really know what the COVID winter plan is going to bring. So I think that, uh, you know, we need to be continuing with the pipeline of activity, uh, trying to build that up um, and instigate um, other priority areas where we can divert resources, where things have slowed down. Uh, we're also looking at uh, pushing the mixed model. It does take quite a long time to get people through the door and that we could use temporary staff as well to try and speed that up. And it also adds flexibility that we don't know yet what the spending review envelope is going to be for uh, the agency. And that would give us flexibility to adapt when we do know. So um, I think uh, the only other thing I was going to say, which again Emily picked up, was around the um, estate strategy and the new ways of working. Um, you'll see from the report that um, 90% have opted to work from home or 50-50. Uh, that clearly have implications for the estate strategy. So we'll be working as that sort of transpires into reality. Uh, we'll be looking to see what that looks like uh, in our estate strategy. So um, that's all I was going to draw out, uh, opening for questions. Thank you very much, uh, Pam. And I should uh, say, whilst also welcoming you, um, I should also uh, thank again uh, Chris Hitchens, who, who left the FSA um, earlier in the summer. Um, uh, the board did have a chance to thank him for his, for his work, but he was with us for a long time did a huge amount of good work and I think we're reaping the legacy and you certainly are Pam in having um, trained up a great team and I think that's left things in, in good shape. Um, any questions that the board have on this report? There's a huge amount of information there which is, is tremendously helpful and I like this sort of dashboardy kind of way you're presenting this so that we can you know become kind of familiar with what, where we can find the relevant information and uh, Mark. I feel like I'm always going first here. Um, it's a fantastic report and tells us an awful lot. So thank you very much to those who put it together. A couple of very quick questions. Um, I can see the public sector reputation tracker, uh, the FSA coming seventh, which is uh, higher than our ambition of ninth. I'm interested to know potentially who came one to six and is there anything we can learn to learn from them? Uh, and my other question relates to the uh, NFCU. There's a comment in here that 33% of closed investigations led to at least one disruption. Uh, and I don't feel I've got the context to understand whether that's good or not. Um, Colin, you perhaps want to take the uh, food crime unit one. I think that's a really good question. That's 33% of three investigations. Uh, so uh, I think we need to, um, we need to look at these, uh, these figures over a longer time frame. Um, what we have done is align our uh, metrics with uh, other law enforcement agencies and, and that will give us an opportunity to benchmark uh, what good looks like. But I think it's really too early and the numbers are too small to really make, draw any major conclusions. And I think on your first point, I'm just going to ask the team to go away, look carefully at those, those ones of others and think how we incorporate that into our, into our planning going, going forward. Um, Stephen oh, might be able Stephen. to answer. Yeah, okay. Uh, what we do know is the uh, NHS blood and transfusion service consistently comes top um, and quite a lot in there are the blue light services but they're not revealed um, as the policy of RepTrack so we don't know who the other six are. Oh, we have to scour their board meetings and find out the ones <laughs> who, are, who are championing that they're three, four, five. Um, I, who else was trying to cap, uh, catch my, Peter, were you, did you know, um, is there anything else from board members, are you all content? 
Well, sign of a great report, everything in, everything in there that we wanted to know. Um, Emily, anything you wanted to add? I feel like you've let us off lightly, so I'm expecting harder questions next time. <laughs> I think, Chair, many of the questions were answered earlier in the report in, in, in my area and, and comforted to hear uh, that we'll be getting more up-to-date financial information going forward. Okay, okay. Right, well then, without, without further ado, we will uh, move on to our next item, which is um, uh, the animal welfare update. Um, and pleased to welcome uh, Darren Whitby, who's our Head of Animal Welfare and Delivery Assurance. Um, Darren's with us uh, on Zoom. And um, uh, Colin is also takes responsibility for this area and I think is going to introduce the paper. Uh, just very briefly, and then I'll hand it over to Darren to cover a little bit more detail. Uh, this is an annual report. It's been a feature for a number of years at the September board. We've, we've updated the board in terms of progress or, uh, uh, against animal welfare. We are, of course, the implementers of other people's policy, so in terms of the Welsh Government and, and DEFRA. And the overall picture is encouraging in terms of the number of non-compliances has reduced uh, compared with uh, 2019 uh, and 2020. Uh, and consumer interest in animal welfare continues. It, it's uh, uh, rated highly in terms of that public attitude tracker that we've been talking about. So I'll hand over to Darren, who'll go through it in a little bit more detail. Hi, good afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me. Yeah, loud and clear. Great, thank you. Uh, so this paper is the annual update on animal welfare activities which we carry out, as Colin mentioned, on behalf of DEFRA and Welsh Government in slaughterhouses. Um, understandably, this year was heavily impacted by COVID, where the focus was on maintaining service delivery whilst ensuring that our monitoring and verifying standards of industry compliance hasn't notably dropped. By way of action plan, within a challenging year, we've managed to keep most of the activity in our action plan on track through the Animal Welfare Steering Group. Uh, this group is drawn from across FSA, FSS, DERA, as well as DEFRA and Welsh Government policy teams. Uh, this year we've also sought uh, participation from APHA to improve the work across the supply chain, particularly for farm and transport data sharing. As part of our drive to be open and transparent, we've extended our publication of non-compliance data from farm, transport and slaughterhouses and we've put that onto food.gov to provide some more detail wherever possible. And I think what this has done is added focus on driving forward some improvements and collaboration between the different enforcement agencies that are involved in animal welfare. And FSA's refreshed a working group to deliver improved reporting systems, evidence sharing, and then supporting better welfare outcomes across the supply chain. In regards to future work, both DEFRA and Welsh Government have outlined potential changes as part of their plans for the future, which we do expect FSA to be closely involved in delivering. The post-implementation review of WATOC and, and the recent consultation on animal um, on welfare in transport uh, have identified some key items for the welfare team to work with policy teams and industry for possible implementation going forwards. Um, and we also expect Welsh Government to uh, develop its approach and deliver mandatory CCTV during the course of this assembly term. I'm not going to dwell on the data storage provided with the paper, as I think these are self-explanatory, uh, but I'll be happy to take questions. Um, and finally, uh, we've asked our analytics team to look into the possible impact of COVID on animal welfare compliance, which is also included. Operationally, there's been a significant draw on our resources to maintain service delivery, which did result in some of our non-essential welfare activities being suspended. The welfare assurance team inspections and uh, a reduction in the supervision by our field and veterinary teams may have had some impact on the number of non-compliances that have been reported. However, greater use of CCTV was utilised where social distancing might have made monitoring more difficult. But I think given the range of factors involved, I think it'd be difficult to draw conclusions, but further analysis in future years will probably provide a more balanced picture. Uh, so these are the key points from the paper, but I'm happy to try and answer any questions that the board may have. 
Thank you, Taryn, and I appreciate you sort of highlighting those limitations um, there because, you know, at first sight, one thinks it's extremely encouraging that these, um, you know, major and the non uh, critical non-compliances non are, are going down. I, I hope they are, um, but I think you've given us an important caveat uh, over that. And of course, you know, any one of these is, is one too many. And um, so really important that we continue to take action in this area. Um, any uh, comments or questions from the board? Um, Tim. Thanks, and thanks for the report. Uh, I think this is a hugely important area, um, public perception and sens sensitivity to uh, ensuring humane management around animals pre-slaughter is absolutely vital. Uh, I'm sure everybody's aware of the Animal Sentience Bill that is coming into play. Um, but I think actually on a, a level of decency and uh, hopefully looking at the provenance of our food, this remains vitally important. I was very pleased to see um, the figures, uh, particularly around the non-compliance, but of course not drawing too many conclusions from that because of all the issues in and around COVID. But I'll just underscore a point I made in the, the actual board meeting was that um, we do need to keep uh, vigilance up in this area. People are more interested in the province of their food um, and I think also perceptions around the meat industry are important that we provide some assurance around standards in this area. I do think there's another issue which is around um, differential approaches in different types and sectors within uh, meat processing. Um, but, uh, again, repeating a point earlier made, but bears repetition, is that uh, the same standards need to apply everywhere. Um, but how we uh, enforce those perhaps needs a differential in sensitivity sometimes. So, overall, great report, uh, very encouraging trends, uh, but we do need to keep a weather eye on what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Yeah, I think the CCTV issue is, is a, a, an interesting one and, um, you know, this greater use of, of this kind of surveillance is, um, it, you know, it's going to be a hot topic, a hot topic for us. How do we, um, how do, how do we realise the potential for that to be a better system um, and how do we really demonstrate uh, that it is, if, if indeed, if indeed it is, because I think that's going to be absolutely crucial to maintaining consumer confidence. It's like we were saying earlier, it's all very well to say, oh, this is better, but I think we need the evidence to show that, that, that it is it's better. Um, I don't know if you wanted to say anything more, Colin, about yeah, CCTV. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Just in, in response to Tim's comments, um, we know that uh, CCTV is playing a part in 10% of our actions, so that's really helpful. We know that the Welsh Government has indicated that it's going to put it in its programme for government, so they're moving in that direction. Um, and, and I think the other point is in relation to um, the, the sensitivity around how we, how we look at uh, accepting that there's one standard and that we have zero tolerance, but in terms of how we respond to different levels of non-compliance. Uh, I and Darren and, and team, the, the team in field ops review the, the higher level non-compliances, level three, level four, on a monthly basis. So we make sure there's consistency applied. Thank you. Um, I think uh, David had raised some questions prior to the meeting. This had to just pop out. I don't know if Emily, you just wanted to reprise those um, for us. Sure. Uh, he um, he mentioned to me earlier that he was concerned about the fact that in the meetings, I think that the board have had with meat hygiene inspectors um, recently, that that often uh, people are raising their concerns that animals are arriving at the lairage um, with injuries, but these have happened en route. And as we know, um, it's not the FSA that's the enforcement body for the transport of animals. We just are responsible from the point um, the animal gets to the lairage. So um, uh, David, I think, was asking, what was there anything more we could do to, to deal with the fact that we're spotting these issues and, and passing those on to the relevant authorities, but um, there's a sense that those issues aren't being acted on sufficiently. Yeah, do we do we get it, it, so if we raise the issue to somebody else, is there any way of us getting the sort of feedback loop going so that we know what's happened? That's exactly what I was going to mention. That that's something we're focusing on and trying to improve. And Darren, you can perhaps give us a little bit more detail as to what we're doing in that respect. But we are um, highlighting to trading standards, and we're highlighting to APHA 
what we're seeing, and then uh, it's obviously for them to prioritise and to act upon it. But we are we are wanting to see the feedback, uh, Darren. Yeah, sure. Um, as I mentioned, we, we have um, a working group which we, we've reinvigorated to work with local authorities and, and APHA um, who have that responsibility further up upstream. Um, and there's a number of items um, about IT um, improvements that could be made, um, a digital evidence uh, repository, but also giving access to the other regulators to be able to sort of close that loop on feedback, whether that be positive or negative by way of feedback that we can then use to, to support the front line. Um, the other thing that we're also looking at is, is building some reports that we can, can proactively share with the different regulators and include DEFRA and Welsh Government in that um, a, a, around where we can analyse the non-compliance data, um, slaughterhouse, transport and farm um, to, to identify whether there are issues around particular conditions, around particular producers or, or even hauliers, um, and then more actively engage with them to seek the feedback so that we can close that loop um, and, and sort of act in the sort of longer term and hopefully reduce some of these areas of concern. Um, that's great, and that's uh, that's really encouraging, and we'll be pleased to hear how that how that develops over over time. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think we're probably just about at the end of that that item. We posed your question for you, David, um, and so we we'll, we can catch you up with the response with that uh, afterwards. Um, anything more from anybody? Okay, thank you, Darren, very much indeed for all your work. Thank you, Colin, and the rest of the team. Um, we're moving on now to the Incidents and Resilience um, Annual Report. Um, and for this one, I'm pleased to welcome Philip Randalls, who's our Head of Incidents and Resilience, who's joining us uh, on Zoom, and uh, Rowinda Ubi, who's the Head of Incidents. Um, the, uh, I, I mentioned earlier this morning that the board have been having a series of, of virtual coffee mornings, giving us an opportunity to meet with some of the some of the FSA teams and hear more directly about their work. And uh, certainly, my first uh, encounter was with the um, incidents uh, unit, and it was just fascinating to hear what they do, the level of detail, and in particular the systems they've set up to ensure we're still able to gather intelligence um, effectively from our European colleagues since, since EU exit. Um, so yes, I was, I was especially interested and took particular note uh, of, of this annual report and um, looking forward to, uh, yes, you just summarising it for us now and then we'll open it up. Thank you very much, Chair. So I'll, I'll just introduce the paper um, and then we'll, we'll obviously take questions. So again, another uh, annual update. Uh, for you, and this one in relation to our work in terms of the UK's food incident response capability. Uh, and um, I suppose the, the key things to draw out uh, for, for, for this particular year are the new ways of working now that we've left uh, the EU and the uh, end of the transition period, and how we've been uh, developing our capability and our capacity in a different set of scenarios. Uh, where we uh, are now looking at uh, no longer having full access to the RASF system, that's the rapid alert system for food and feed that is an EU system, and how we've uh, developed an alternative approach for England and Wales, uh, where we're now communicating with other countries through the Infosan arrangements, the Infosan network, that's the International Food Safety Authorities network, which is a network of 180 countries. Uh, whilst recognising that Northern Ireland remains connected to the RASF network under the Northern Ireland Protocol. And also to highlight that uh, what we do in, in partnership with Food Standards Scotland is to take a, a four-nation approach to ensure consistency across the UK uh, when dealing with incidents. And then also to highlight um, that um, it, as part of our um, response to EU exit, we have We've recognised the need for greater stakeholder engagement with both internationally and with, with industry uh, within the UK. And in terms of our international engagement, that has involved, as I've mentioned, working with Infosan. It involves a secondi in, in Geneva to improve channels of communication. Uh, it also means that the UK is now represented on the Infosan Working Group and the Infosan Advisory Group. And in terms of uh, high profile, we are running uh, next month as you will be aware, the Global Food Safety Conference, uh, which we are hoping to attract a lot of interest in, and certainly um, registrations would suggest that that is the case. 
And with industry um, uh, on top of the existing food industry liaison group, we've established an importer working group uh, industry forum. And also then finally, just to talk about the systems that underpin our work, uh, the receipt and management team continue to monitor signals. Uh, that's the uh, signals of potential risk to, to the UK via our new uh, bespoke um, signals and prioritization dashboard that we've developed uh, in the, as a result of the, the, the need to have systems in place to replace EU systems. And uh, finally then to also mention something that hasn't probably had as, as much attention as it ought to because of diversion uh, into responding to COVID and the winter plan pressures where we were bullet dealing uh, at the turn of the year with both uh, COVID and uh, the impact of e uh, EU transition ending. Um, and that was is root cause uh, analysis and the fact that we want to pick that up and, and take it further forward with um, development of a system where we'll be able to uh, take data from companies and be able to uh, learn about the, the global picture in terms of root cause analysis. But it's a system which protects those industry, those companies individually from any data sharing uh, and sharing with their competitors. Um, so asking the board to, to note the work of the Incidents and Resilience Unit over the last year and our continued approach to developing our incident management capability. Thank you. Um, any comments uh, or questions from the board? Um, Margaret. I've just noticed that word divergence coming up again. And um, we've mentioned it quite a lot, but um, clearly it's um, beginning to impact um, in an increasing way on the work you're doing. I don't know whether you want to make any other comment on that. And then the other question was, um, at, the, at the moment, um, obviously last winter you had your, um, you set up the winter emergency plan. Are you anticipating that might have to happen again this year? If I take the first one, uh, the second one first, and that, that is, we are alive to that, and we are looking at that, and we will, we are, we are, we are considering um, what might need to be done. So um, we haven't made any decisions, but it's it's a, a live issue. Um, in terms of uh, divergence, obviously EU exit has happened, and access to RAS of systems, uh, we've moved on beyond that. We don't think we're any worse off as a result of the systems that we have built in place to replace the RAS of. Uh, arrangements and in some ways our system is now more bespoke uh, for England and Wales than, than the system we had previously. I was kind of thinking about the legal side of things as well, sort of 7.3 in the paper, which is um, you talk about um, the um, domestic legislative reviews occur, we expect this to be an increasing area of focus and divergence may occur as the UK moves, moves forwards with the two regulatory systems. Rebecca, yeah, well, while, while Colin's um, reflecting, I, I, I can just add that um, the, the, the way in which we may need to work uh, under different regulatory systems with potentially products um, meeting different uh, regulatory standards um, uh, on the market uh, in, in different parts of uh, the United Kingdom is something that we have been giving a lot of attention to uh, and it's something that we're considering um, in, you know, very carefully. It's, uh, I don't say we have all the answers but it's something that we're, we're very aware of because our advice to enforcement officers is going to need to be um, really clear and it's something that, that we'll, we'll be coming back to in future. Colin, I'll let you just... Was no, I, I, I think that's covered it, yeah. Okay, David. I, I was, Chair, I was intrigued by Colin's remark, if I understood it correctly, that we have lost nothing under the rapid alert system and that we've um, our, our, own, our own system is now more bespoke. Now is not the time, but if I got it, understood it correctly, I'd love to see a one-page paper um, setting out why that's the case. We can certainly provide you with more detail. Um, we would still like access to the full system yeah. uh, because we like things belt and braces, but um, we, we don't think that it, it, there's any greater risk to food safety in the UK as a result of, of, of the systems we have in place. That's not the public perception, so I'd love to see the justification in due course.
thank you, Susan. Yet uh, again, a couple of questions, if I may, uh, and one actually picking up on, on just that point. One of the advantages of the RASF system is that it was publicly available uh, and therefore readily available to our local authority partners at ports and inland to inform their sampling strategies and so on. Uh, Infosan, as I understand it, is a member-only organisation. It's not broadly available, so I'd be interested to know uh, what we're doing to help our local authority partners bridge that intelligence gap in their uh, sample planning. Uh, and my other comment, completely separate, is around the work on uh, root cause analysis. I appreciate it's early days and, and, and we appear to be uh, starting off on that, but um, identifying lessons, which is root, what root cause analysis is all about, is only the first step. Um, the, I suppose the holy grail, for want of a better phrase, is uh, not just identifying, but learning those lessons and knowing that you've learned those lessons. Uh, so just be interested to know if we're, if we're planning to move through all three stages of that kind of uh, learning. Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, that, that program is at the, uh, at the outset. It has been delayed because of COVID, but absolutely it's a case of um, determining what are the root causes, what are the most frequent root causes, uh, and then from that um, having conversations with industry through those four that I mentioned uh, so that there's not repeats. Um, and then in terms of access to local authorities, I'll perhaps uh, ask Philip to come in or, or Raj. Philip, do you want to comment on that? Yes, apologies, just struggling to come off mute there. Right, okay, in terms of um, <clears throat> the RASAF system and the communication um, uh, uh, benefits that it actually had uh, prior to, obviously, EU exit, we were in a position that, obviously, we could see major alerts coming into the UK, uh, and we were in a position to be able to respond to those, as well as doing that the same the other way around as well, by uh, any issues from the UK out to uh, member states, we were able to communicate, and then uh, responses would come in. That part of the um, operation hasn't changed. Um, uh, there is still a legal requirement for the Commission to actually communicate risks uh, that are entering the UK to us as a competent authority. So, so that is secure. In terms of the communications um, to local authorities um, uh, and the benefits that they were uh, achieving from the uh, total data that was in ASAF, that has somewhat diminished. But indeed, we've opened up a number of other forums for communication, uh, primarily with industry and local authorities to try and, uh, uh, and make sure that that communication is appropriate for their planning arrangements. Thank you. Um, Tim, I think you had a question. Thank you. Mine's a very specific question, just looking through the incident data and in particular those received by hazard category. Um, I noticed that the residues of veterinary medicinal products is actually quite high up on the list. Um, two issues there. One is that uh, that's a concern from antimicrobial resistance, and I don't know whether or not those medicinal residues are antibiotics, but um, it'd be good to know. And if so, perhaps we can pick that up in the AMR report. But the other issue is that FCI reporting, food chain information reporting, which is obligated on producers or suppliers of livestock to markets, um, there's obviously a lack of non-compliance there, if that's the case. Um, and so I just wondered how that's being addressed. Is there conversations going on with the Veterinary Medicines Directorate? Um, and what nature are those? Thank you. Colin? And I'm, I'm going to ask Philip if he can come in on that one. Thank you, Colin. So in terms of relationships uh, around veterinary medicines, um, first thing I'll point out is that the numbers that we see on incidents are not necessarily re re uh, relevant or, or in direct relationship to change in the food safety landscape. Um, it's really a matter of what's been reported and how things have been reported. So, so we're not saying there's a change in the, in, 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 in the safety landscape. That's the, the first point I'd make. Secondly, um, all of the incidents that, that, that we deal with are um, obviously followed up. Um, they're obviously um, uh, a subject of investigation between ourselves and with the uh, VND colleagues, um, and indeed wider wider um, uh, sort of government uh, engagement as necessary. So there are, are active and, and well-established routes for investigations around these. 
I take the point, Philip, that the reporting isn't a measure of risk, but nonetheless, it's the best indicator we've got of trends in, in risk. Um, so, I w yeah, I, I, I feel a little bit more anxious about it than you're sounding. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, it's a very fair comment that you, you, you've made there, Susan. I think, I think the last 12 months have been very um, up and down in terms of incident numbers. As you'll see from the paper, that there has been a, an overall downturn, um, and that overall downturn hasn't necessarily been uh, across the board. Um, it's, it's, it's been a downturn in certain areas. We've now seen a, a re-increase in numbers of incidents back to levels uh, pre-EU uh, exit. So we're, we're confident at the moment that there is no major landscape change between now and pre-pandemic um, and pre-EU exit. Uh, thanks for that. Um, I'm just trying to sort of reconcile your answer with my question, uh, because I think what my concern is, is that even if there's no significant change, that's not your words, but landscape change, uh, what are we doing to push it down even further? Are the controls adequate? Could they go further? And have we got tangible and practical solutions that are giving a different outcome by nature of our relationships with other organisations. I mean, from 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 my point of view, uh, obviously leading the instance and response function, uh, we we do follow up through our policy colleagues all of the issues that we see. We look to diminish the numbers of incidents continually, and we have an active incident prevention program. Um, colleagues in. BMD and, and other government establishments also have similar approaches. Um, probably too much information in terms of going into this particular session, but I'd be quite happy to provide a written answer to you um, perhaps in the coming days. Thank you for that. Are there any other uh, comments or points to raise um, on this? Um, Julie, I think you were trying to come in. Yes, thank you. I was just Picking up on um, the FCI and, um, and CCIR data that um, flows down through the system with the animals, and that's um, where we have a dependency on the Livestock Information Service that is being developed by DEFRA and AHGB. So it's important that we play our role and to ensure our requirements are fed in there because that should give us an end to end, or at least from our point of view, um, from birth to carcass end-to-end -end view of the meat part of the supply chain um, but I, I wouldn't like to be um, building anything um, in addition to that at, at this time. Thank you. Um, so if there's nothing more I'll close this um, item. I'm um, very much looking forward to the uh, Global Food Safety Conference and coming to speak at that um, and uh, I know that some board members I think are planning to, to join at, le at least part of those, uh, those sessions um, so that, that would be helpful. Colin? I, I just wanted to say that this is obviously a fluid time because of Covid and because of EU exit and the, the depression in the numbers and you know we're not clear of uh, you know, if there's an underlying trend there, we think we're back to where we were before. Um, but it, it probably needs to, to be something we reflect on and look at over the, the next number of months. And I, I don't know whether Raj could give us a, a flavor of um, some of the things that she's been dealing with, you know, just as a practical examples of uh, the sorts of things day and daily that uh, the unit deal with. Um, sure, why not? We've got a couple of minutes. Thanks, Colin, and, and thank you, Chair. So um, on a daily basis, we receive a number of incident notifications from a variety of different stakeholders. And um, recently, we've been dealing with um, pancytopenia in cats, um, a, a, an outbreak um, in relation to cats. And um, we've also got a number of inc other incidents which have been ongoing, salmonella, randrep in melons, which um, we've been having a lot of liaison with um, our counterparts in other countries, such as Honduras and Costa Rica. Uh, and also a number of um, other incidents which are currently ongoing, um, which obviously um, we have our processes and procedures for dealing with in terms of our incident management plans and our non-incident management plans. So um, a, a lot of work on a day-to-day -day basis um, is undertaken for incidents. And just coming back on your question, Tim, um, 
uh, we can certainly look into the question you asked in terms of you know the veterinary residues um, incidents and we can definitely come back to you with an answer on that so I'm happy to provide something after the meeting Thank you. Um, obviously, a huge amount of work was done on the female pancytopenia um, issue, and um, uh, yeah, yeah it's, I mean, it shows how hard these things these things are to get to the, to get to the bottom of. Um, do you, I know some of this has been tracked back through international supply chains? Um, do you think that our ability to do that has been, you know? Uh, I guess that's a test case of whether our systems are working as well as they would have done previously, or ha has it been harder because of EU exit, or you know, was it just one of those that was always going to be hard? Uh, so uh, as yet, there's been no to, um, clear link uh, to food, uh, to, to, to cat food. Um, there's no causative link. Um, so we, we don't know the, the underlying cause of the heightened levels of pancytopenia. Um, we um, have used our networks to, uh, to trace back with the, working with the manufacturers and a, and a supplier in Russia. Um, so uh, I guess EU exit's not really relevant to that given the, the, the location of that particular supplier. But um, I, uh, there's more work to be done in this. It's a multi-agency response. Um, uh, there were some my mycotoxins found in some of the samples, but uh, as I say, we weren't able to establish a causative link. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all the team on the ground doing this. I mean, it's a sort of fast paced, really, you know, you never know when incidents are, get, are going to come up and uh, that makes it quite a stressful job. I, I absolutely see that. So we're incredibly grateful for all the work that goes into that. Right, uh, we're going to, um, um, well, I suppose I should, so I, I, I just want to be sure that the board are content as, as much as we can be, that the systems which are in place now are sufficient um, post-EU exit or whether there is anything more specifically that you want the, the team to look at um, or, you know, the sense I'm getting from the board is this is a, we need to keep a close eye on this um, uh, but it's too early really to draw any conclusions and we need to just let it let it roll out uh, a little bit further is that a fair summary okay thank you so moving on now the next item on the agenda is um, uh, another annual report and this relates to um, uh, a number of, of interrelated things, freedom of information requests, external complaints and internal whistleblowing cases. Um, this is a, a really important um, agenda item um, and we need to carefully consider how we're responding to effectively these, ex these scrutiny questions about, about the way we work um, and in particular about how we behave uh, when things sadly go wrong. Um, so um, yes, let, uh, let's um, hear the report. I think Noel Sykes, who's our Head of Standards and Reward, and Jenny Desira um, are joining us on Zoom. Um, but I think Maria uh, is going to introduce this paper in her role as uh, Director of uh, Regulatory Compliance and People. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, yes, this is our um, a, a regular report that comes round to the board on um, FOI requests that the FSA receives and how we deal with them. Um, also, any external complaints that we get. Um, and importantly as well, internal whistleblowing or people raising a concern within the FSA. Um, and hopefully um, the report will uh, reflect the fact that um, we really are committed to being open and transparent. Um, and we also want to learn lessons and improve as an organisation all the time. So um, that's um, what we aim to do when we deal with these uh, complaints and requests. Um, I want to introduce you firstly to um, Jenny Desira, who's our Head of Knowledge uh, Information Management. Um, this is a report that has jointly been complied by um, people in my um, People and Organisational Change team and also in Julie's Knowledge and Information Management team. So I'm going to hand over to Jenny first and then you'll hear from Noel. Thank you, Maria. Um, I'm here to cover the Freedom of Information side of the paper. 
We've continued to maintain a high level of compliance in answering requests in a timely manner over the last year and a half. We have acted on the feedback from last year and broken down the categories of requests in the paper as much as we can to give the board a visibility of what we've been asked about. Um, but I do need to reflect on the point that F FOI questions can be about anything at all. So it's still the case that 38% of our requests over the last period um, were about one-off topics, so grouped together as other. I would like to thank everyone in the FSA who's worked on freedom of information requests over the last year, particularly the information owners, as without their support, we would not be able to maintain our high compliance rate for freedom of information. And our information owners are really key in making decisions about the information in their remit. The final point I just want to emphasise is that the freedom of information function has moved this year to be based with data protection and information management. This means that we can now offer an integrated privacy and openness information rights advisory service to FSA colleagues. It also means that we can support information owners further in their critical role at the FSA in terms of managing, exploiting and publishing our data. The recommendation in the paper for the board to agree is to support a review of the Freedom of Information Service offering to align FOI awareness with the wider responsibilities and awareness raising that we do for information owners in the FSA. I will now hand over to Noel Sykes to present the complaints and whistleblowing part of the paper. Uh, thank you, Jenny, and thank you, Chair, and good afternoon. Um, I'll just say a few words about each of the subjects that fall within my portfolio, starting with uh, complaints. Um, I'd first like to open by thanking all those colleagues across the FSA who have worked hard over the last year, um, ensuring that we properly investigate and respond to complaint cases. The, in the paper, we emphasise the trends we are seeing of a reducing number of formal complaints and critically, I believe, in also the number that has subsequently escalated through the various stages. And it's important to emphasise that this is against a backdrop of increased accessibility to our complaints process and the presence of a clear policy statement on complaints on food.gov. Um, over the last two years, I believe our work has paid off uh, in, in this regard in terms of improving our complaint management response and I also, um, as is highlighted in the paper, want to particularly emphasise how we've worked hard to, wherever possible, handle um, contacts that we get within the agency through a business as usual uh, route. Uh, we believe this can provide the best customer service uh, to the individual. And the paper highlights the increasing number of instances where we've uh, been able to let that happen. Um, Given the progress that we feel we've made in the, in, if you like, the formal complaint space, uh, we now think the time is right to uh, broaden the evidence base from which we might glean the best insights into expressions of dissatisfaction uh, provided to or made about um, the FSA. And the committee will note um, a priority that we're asking it to agree to in this regard. Just very quickly, on the second subject of internal whistleblowing, uh, the paper provides insight to policy development, our use of feedback to improve the process, and some basic detail about individual cases. But just to emphasize two particular points, um, this portfolio uh, now sits within the wider people and organizational change team. And that allows us the opportunity to now to really look at the whole issue of speaking up in the, in the FSA in a holistic sense. And again, one of the priorities that we set out in the paper reflects this. And finally, again, the paper um, mentions performance captured from the people survey data, the annual civil service people survey, that is. And again, we're asking the board to, um, to support our priority in using that data going forward to target interventions across the agency to drive forward further improvement. Um, hopefully that's been helpful. And with that, Chair, I, I'll hand back to you to take any questions for, for Jenny and I. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I agree uh, that the direction of travel on this is, is, is good. Um, 
I would be helpful, Noel, to hear a little bit more about what you're actually going to do in relation to improving the speak up experience. So, um, you know, it's easy to say that. It's, it's yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in what, how, how are we going to do that? Okay, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, well, first of all, I, I should emphasise that, first and foremost, we'd want to work from the platform that already exists in respect of what I believe to be a very positive sense of engagement with staff and particularly our trade unions. And I would like just to make a note of the support we get from trade unions um, it, within this space. Um, I mentioned earlier bringing this portfolio into the POC team. That allows myself um, as nominated officer to work closely with the heads uh, of portfolios that include bullying and harassment, diversity and inclusion, and other areas. And that will allow us to um, develop proposals, go back to staff, go back to trade unions, and um, really develop um, an approach to speak up where individual employees recognize and see a single point of reference or a single route. So it makes it easier and it makes it more accessible. We haven't got to the detail yet chair that those conversations need to be had but that's the work we're proposing to take forward going forward okay comments from other board members on this paper tim thanks and thanks for the report um i was fascinated to look at the proportionality of foi requests and I heard what you just said around going back to individual leads to look for solutions, which is great. But I did wonder how much of the requests and where there has actually been whistleblowing as well, where they overlap. So that two or three people from different disciplines actually see they're looking at different perspectives of the same problem or the same principle that is going awry. Because certainly in trying to address the problems rather than deal with putting a, a band-aid on it from one perspective we could actually fundamentally address something that might be more entrenched within the way we operate and I wonder how much of that featured in the responses. Thanks. Will, will I take that question? Yes now? please now. No chair? Yeah uh, thank you Tim and I'm sure Jenny will come in um, if she feels she wants to add to what I will say. Um, we don't see a great deal of overlap in terms of casework between FOI and complaints. But what we have seen in the past is perhaps an FOI request coming in first and almost as a, a preemptive step to then potentially developing a complaint um, on the back of it. Um, I should point out it's an important principle that in handling FOI, we have to remain uh, requester and reason blind. So we don't allow any FOI request to influence um, the information that we will release, and we certainly wouldn't allow it to influence how we then might subsequently have to handle a complaint. But we don't see a great deal of interaction between the two, Tim, um, as I say, more typically as a preemptive um, measure ahead of a complaint coming in. I don't know if Jenny wants to add to that. I think, um, oh, oh, Jenny, were you going to say something? Thank you, Noel. Um, I, I agree with what Noel said, and I think the only other comment that I would make is that Although, as we've described, freedom of information has, has moved from sitting with complaints into a different team. Um, Noel and I and our teams very much work together in a very collaborative way. Um, and so, as Noel has said, although there isn't a great correlation between complaints and freedom of information, in terms of the, the wider picture um, and in terms of how we know that data protection complaints and freedom of information do have synergies, we would make sure that we keep those links um, and keep those discussions going within our teams so that we don't miss anything if there's something that we need to address. Emily. I just wanted to add that I think um, for, uh, in a way, the complaints and FOIs piece is a snapshot of some feedback that the organisation is getting. And whatever feedback we get, whether it's um, in, a, in a frustrated uh, or um, very disappointed complaint, or whether it's in a more... Um, uh, uh, gentle um, uh, conversation that happens with the meat hygiene inspector, we need to be harnessing it. And if we're not listening to um, what the people are that we're engaged, the people we're engaging with, then we are losing out on opportunities to improve. Um, so, so this is this is just one end of a, of a bigger question. Um, th from an operational point of view, the account management system that we have does enable a lot more of that feedback to go to and fro. So, I think that's helpful. 
But one of the issues we've been looking at um, a bit in the background over the last year because of COVID, but which I hope we'll come to in the next few months, is the question of the, the most uh, significant services that we run in the organisation. Now, the, the um, meat inspection, dairy inspection, wine inspection um, has qualities of a service. It's a regulatory service, but we need to always be hearing what it's like for the person on the end of that to receive it. The regulated products one is, is the one that we've just started this year and will also potentially be the subject of frustration and feedback and so on. So we need to be open to that too. So I think um, in my mind, this, this is a snapshot of one of, of uh, particular types of feedback, but we need to think in a services approach. And, and by that, I mean, we have directors who are responsible for those things who are um, and service owners who are trying to open to all of that feedback that's coming. I don't think we're quite there yet. We've got a way to go, but that's, that's what I would hope for. It's really interesting, Emily, thank you. Margaret. Um, thank you, I've got um, just three little questions. One is, is there any further news on the cases sent to the Information Commissioner? Uh, secondly, um, on whistleblowing, um, I think it's always difficult to find the best way of encouraging staff to speak out without fear. And um, understand one of the ways is to convince people that they may not get uh, the result they want um, because they may have understood or uh, misunderstood something in a complaint and that that doesn't matter, but it's still okay to speak out as long as the, the, by speaking out they're not being malicious. And then the third point separately is on transparency. And I'd quite like to know a little more, and you may not be able to do it now, about our FOI requests and uh, what dictates what we do or don't publish. Is it um, based on government policy or is it based on what we think is information that's too sensitive to publish? Um, now, who am I going to, uh, oh, Julie's uh, putting her hand up to take those. Mm -hmm. um, well, certainly the, the final point around what, what's published, um, I think we should um, take that offline. Um, but um, the answer is, it's, it's a combination of um, um, the um, direction we get from um, Cabinet Office, from government, um, and also the FSA's own view of the um, risk, whether it's operational risk, um, risk to our staff, reputational risk, etc. So it's a combination of both. Um, but we do um, apply a, a process, so um, it, 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 is, it is measured, it is considered, and it, it is applied um, before any information is published. Having said that, um, a reminder as to our um, sort of fundamental priority to be as open and transparent as we possibly can, so we're, we're applying that principle as well. Um, Noel, I don't know if you want to pick up the point about the referral to the Ombudsman or whether, uh, yeah, Noel, can I ask you uh, to speak to that? Yep. Sorry, Chair, I think the question was about referral to the ICO, so um, I will hand over to Jenny, but it, can I just take the question that I think it was Margaret that asked about whistleblowing and encouraging people to speak up and have confidence that y you're working in a safe place. Um, Margaret, I, I totally agree. Uh, one of the challenges that all nominated officers have across government is developing that sense amongst the workforce that um, it is safe to speak up. And even if their perceptions were not correct, that is not a bad thing. Um, and um, I should have pointed out, Chair, and forgive me when you, when you asked me about what work was being done in terms of a holistic approach and how could I have forgotten? Uh, but only next week we are hosting our annual uh, speak up awareness campaign, which which brings together all those areas that I mentioned. But uh, um, Margaret, I want to particularly emphasise that this year we have been successful in garnering testimonials from staff who actually came into the process and spoke up and offering first hand experience of that process. And we think that's um, a very valuable contribution to make toward developing confidence in the process. Um, with that, Chair, if I may, I'll hand over to Jenny, who will I think answer the question on the ICO cases. Thanks, Noel. Um, yes, in terms of the, the two cases we've got with the Information Commission at the moment, um, I'm pleased to report that since this paper was written, uh, one of the cases has come to an end and the outcome was that the ICO upheld the Food Sums Agency's position that we took on that um, and so no further action is required of us. 
Um, the other case is at the point where we are waiting for further information from the Information Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments? No, okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, so we were asked to note essentially really the next steps for, for this work, which I think have all been covered, and I sense general agreement from the, from the board that we'll, we'll continue as set out in the paper. Okay, so we're moving on now to a paper which is essentially in here really uh, for information, but uh, we, it's an important topic. We've got a few minutes uh, for discussion if, if anybody wants to raise comments. Uh, this is about our annual update on antimicrobial resistance. Of course, our work in this area is really uh, just part of a bigger, you know, not only national but, but international work in this area. Um, and um, I'm going to ask, I think, Rick Mumford, who's, who's with us uh, online, um, just to briefly summarise that paper. Rick. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Susan. So um, as, um, as you've just said, it's really the, uh, the take home message for the board here is that um, the FSA continues to maintain an active programme of surveillance and research in the area of uh, antimicrobial resistance, AMR, related to the food supply chain. Um, and I think through doing that, we, we um, ensure that we continue to play an important role within the, the government's ambition in, in tackling this uh, global challenge and, um, and in particular working, um, playing a positive role within the uh, five year national action plan. Um, so I won't go into any more detail than that. But as I say, the paper is there for info and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. And I think perhaps the board might like to note that we had a, a message from uh, Dame Sally Davis, who's obviously, um, uh, you know, had a lot of leadership in this area, very much supporting uh, what we're doing and, and offering to continue to, to work with us in this. Um, are there any comments um, from the board? Robin, this is an area of interest to you. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add. Uh, certainly, yeah, just to highlight, I think overall the report is very good news. Uh, it looks very promising. I guess the two points I might pick up, one particularly good piece of news in there, I think, is the public perception report, which shows that actually uh, antimicrobial resistance is still very high in the public um, view, despite all the distractions of COVID over the last uh, 18 months. So I think that's, that's encouraging. Um, and the second point, as, as you mentioned, Susan, and as Rick mentioned too, this is clearly a national and international effort, uh, and particularly going forward uh, with, for instance, the reform of agriculture, which will have implications in terms of uh, potential uh, uh, the health of, of livestock and antibiotic use. Uh, we're very closely engaged uh, with colleagues, particularly in DEFRA, uh, Environment Agency and others, uh, to keep a, a very close watching brief on that and be ready to respond appropriately. But overall, I think um, very, very positive news in the report. Thank you. Uh, Ruth. Sorry, I know it's mainly for noting the good progress that's been made on, on AMR and the, and the role we play. Um, I was just interested in the situation in chicken um, and in Para 7.2 it's sort of fairly tentative that we anticipate commissioning surveys for beef and pork and we're exploring commissioning new surveys for chicken and turkey and I, I guess it's just seeking comfort, uh, reassurance that we are definitely maintaining our level of surveillance but also given the results on poultry uh, should, is there anything else we should be doing? Rick can I ask you to pick that up? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, just to confirm, yes, we will be carrying on the surveillance. The, the certain degree of um, hesitancy was because we're in a transition period where we moved from um, the surveys we were doing before on fresh meat were, were related to the EU harmonised surveys. So we've been moving to a position where those those have moved and we're now moving to um, uh, um, surveys that we will run um, within Great Britain. Uh, so yes, they will start. They will start this year with with beef and lamb, and then we will bring in um, we we'll bring in poultry in, in subsequent years. Remembering that the EU harmonised surveys worked on an, um, a biannual cycle, so we did red meat and then um, white meat. So yes, they will be continuing. Robin, 
Thanks. Just uh, two quick points in addition, Ruth. Uh, one is I've mentioned to the board previously about the cross-government uh, surveillance project that is now officially launched called PathSafe. So that's with many other colleagues and other departments. And a key focus of that is on AMR in, in the environment, in farms and in food. So we'll update the board on progress on that. Um, and on your point about anything else we should be looking for, um, as an example, earlier in the year, we, we looked quite carefully at the question of whether COVID measures, anti-COVID measures, might inadvertently have an impact on AMR. So, for instance, massive use of alcohol disinfection. Was there any risk that that is likely to inadvertently select for AMR? Um, and I'm really happy to say the team did a great job of looking at that, and we don't feel that's any more concerning. So uh, we're very alert to those possibilities. Thank you. Um, it's uh, it's always great to have these papers, but I know people try to keep them very, you know very short, and and that's brilliant. But it's always lovely to hear those additional examples. It provides real reassurance that that you're on the case. So thank you for all the work on that. Very good. Um, so I think we'll close that item, and that actually brings us uh, to the end of the formal agenda. Um, uh, as previously, um, I'm not expecting any other business, but if something pressing that you didn't have an opportunity to raise earlier. Um, no? In which case, um, thank you all very much for your um, engagement today, your preparation and reading beforehand, um, and to all of the executive team for huge amount of work that they do day in, day out, um, and uh, we really, really value that. So I'm going to close the meeting, look forward to seeing the board again for our retreat uh, next month and uh, to hopefully having another in-person uh, board meeting in Cardiff in December. Thank you all. Bye-bye.